Welcome to Off Planet Radio, offplanetradio.com. I'm Randy Moggins. I'm here with Emily Moyer and our special guest tonight. And uh, uh, coming off of uh, a trip out to Houston, where I attended the Paracon conference, and uh, that's a story in itself. Let me just say that Houston is a city with intense energies, amplified even more so by the trauma they've just gone through at the hands of the weather, weather lords. So... Um, very interesting situation in Houston, but it is a city that's kind of come back and rallied, and uh, we had a pretty ripping conference as well. Uh, Emily, you want to you want to intro our guest for us, please? <laughs> you said you were going to do it. That's a mean thing. Uh-huh. Anyway, all Home right. Call. So uh, we have a, a returning guest tonight. Who's even before he was a guest here, he's always been one of our favorites. But we certainly enjoyed our last show with him, and uh, we're here to rip through a couple of. Uh, issues that Randy wants to talk about. And then we're going to dive into what uh, we consider to be the big issue, which is time. But we have no idea what our guest is going to say because he, said, call, he contacted us and said he'd like to talk about it. So we are really looking forward to this. Cliff, hi. Welcome back to Off Planet Radio. Thank you very much. Uh, it was quite enjoyable the last time, and I suspect we might have a good time this time. <laughs> oh, I think we will. So, uh, <laughs> wow, time. We're going to talk about that, and that's, that's the conundrum in itself. Before we get into the main topic tonight, um, there's a number of issues that are going on right now in the financial world, one of which, this was my breakfast reading on Sunday morning, if you can see that. And that's the Wall Street Journal Weekend Edition. Up a little, edition. up a little, Randy. Up. Yeah. How's that? To the left. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Perfect. All right, there we go. There we go. Okay, so you got it. So... This has actually been screaming in the headlines now for um, several weeks. The uh, Equifax data breach that compromised 143 million Americans' records, which includes dates of birth, social security numbers, and I would assume as well probably lines of credit information and massive other amounts of data that they've accumulated as well. That headline was the heralding of the resignation of the chief technology officer and the head of security for Equifax. And this data breach has been profound in that it's really rippled out into the markets in interesting ways and created a fair amount of speculation as to the future of an integrity of credit reporting, hence the use of credit re- marketing, credit report marketing itself. There's another interesting thing that happened is that hundreds of thousands of people responded by freezing all of their present credit activity uh, through these bureaus, as a result of which it means that lenders can no longer lend money or leverage off of the the credit asset base of these these, uh, perceived consumers of credit. And the banks, banks operate on markets and basically demand that they have a healthy flow of credit worthy borrowers. As a result of that, I guess you would say you've seen a reduction in the credit market's potential right now because of this breach. So a couple of questions, Cliff. I don't know how closely you followed this or watched it, but what's your initial take on what happened here and how profound is it in terms of market integrity? It's seriously profound. It's probably doomed Equifax and its two other, uh, let's call them the co-op competitors because they're cooperative companies that are also theoretically competitive. And it uh, has revealed all kinds of shenanigans at the level of the Cliff, Federal hold on Reserve. A second, Cliff, we're, yeah. we're having, it, it, your volume suddenly got very low. When we were talking before the show, it was great, and now we can have Yeah, hide. it was. Right. <coughs> uh, how are we doing now? That's better. Better, better. Yes. okay. Uh, Equifax is in a funny situation. It has these two other uh, competitors that are also, uh, they also cooperate with, and they share data with, do risk analysis. 
risks. And that's really what job they're in. They're providing a, an aggregated risk analysis at various different levels on individuals to organizations. And when they do it, it's much more than just your name, social security number, and some kind of a ranking as to your credit level. It's your birth date, it's all your medical records, potentially any other court issues. It brings in all of this stuff because of their source material. What they actually do is take all their source material, run it through an algorithm, and present that the results of their particular algorithm to the banks. The banks never see the raw material anymore. It used to be when you went in to get a loan, the bank would actually have some of this information on the loan. But nowadays, they rely on these three credit companies to do it for them. There's a reason for doing this, because they can sue those credit companies for not doing the due diligence. Now, this is an interesting situation, because Equifax was hacked months, five months before they released the information that they did. Cliff, I'm sorry to interrupt you again one more time. The volume seems to have dropped a little bit again, and I just want to make sure everybody's hearing you. because uh, Sure, sure. I'll, I'll get real close to this thing then. All okay. right. Um, uh, so five months before they released the information, Equifax actually was hacked. And the way that the hack occurred was, uh, I'm going to have to presume here, okay? I'm going to make some presumptions on some things I've read about, and I'm presuming from a technical bias. And I'm presuming that what happened was that they were initially cracked, and then there was a bleed out, as opposed to someone coming and taking the database. So I'm assuming that the way in which the crack went down was over the course of a many months. And it was not a crack in and get a big dump off of a database because that kind of activity is easily seen. This is one of the reasons I'm presuming this, right? If, if for instance, I was running a, um, secured, or running a network that had secure assets behind it, which I have done, you do things like set up packet monitors and other stuff on your own network to see if all of a sudden there's traffic you can't account for. And that's one of the ways you look for someone having cracked into your system is basically to see, wait a second, why is there all this traffic through the servers? The processors are running and copying like mad. All the disks are humming when it's, you know, 830 at night and people have mostly gone home. And so you have these little algorithmic triggers that let you know things like that. They dial the security officer uh, by a remote, used to be a pager in my day when I set those things up, so that these people would be paged in the middle of the night if any one of these 10 or 12 conditions went off, right? And so I presume that that was the kind of system that they had guarding everybody's data. I could be quite wrong on that, especially since- No, actually, the, you, uh, you, actually your summary, that was spot on. The Wall Street Journal report said, um, they began seeing suspicious network traffic on July 29th associated with U.S. online dispute portal web application. It says the security team investigated blocked questionable traffic and noticed, then saw more sus suspicious activity the following day. It's then when the company took the web application offline. The web application was, um, let's look in here to see if I can find this piece of kind of thing. It was an application known as Apache Struts, which I suspect is a, a server level Apache server for those yeah, geeks it, out there. Exactly. It's a it's an old style um, yeah. overlay to Apache. It's a stack. It's basically exactly. like a stack. But it's built on Apache, which is, you know, it's got so many old style security yeah. holes yeah. in it. It's any day anymore, people are going to be using stacks built on Node or jQuery or something. And so it wasn't that they didn't come in through the scripts. This is why I'm presupposing that they put a back door in and bled it out over time yeah. just to avoid the kind of trigger that eventually did get the attention of the security people. But of course, now bear in mind, we have to reference the fact that the head of security there was a music major. <laughs> that always works out so well. It sure does. Sure does. You know, those clarinets are just so useful for <laughs> diagnosing uh, network traffic. Anyway, so Equifax is really, you know, they've, they've seriously screwed the pooch on this one. And all of these people are going to be ending up with um, huge amounts of problems, myself among them, because I'm one of the people in the United States that's used that service because I had sought a yep. loan a few years back through a uh, bank. So I'll have a, a decayed record in there. Now, then there's the other side of it. If we see it from the side of the poor hackers, uh, you know, they've got all these millions of records. What are they going to do with them? You know, you need a serious data mining to be able to pull out an individual record out of all of this. It's not hashed. It's not encrypted in most most circumstances. It's just straight SQL data, but without the appropriate software on top of it, it'll take them some time to get the uh, nuggets out that are worth selling. On the other hand, um, 
I don't want to be an alarmist, but Equifax could be merely a gateway. Yeah, because yeah. because yeah. Equifax runs connections into so many other uh, systems through APIs, someone may have discovered an API somewhere else that was vulnerable by going through Equifax. The and API, so, by the way, sports fans is application programming interface. It's basically the means through which um, the, the programs are written. And whether or not they can talk to each other. Right. right, right. And basically I write a program and I say, okay, I'm going to let some other program use these part of the services I'm already providing to my own code. And here's the holes for that to occur mm -hmm. in my code. And, and so the, uh, the API is open uh, frequently to certain kinds of activities. And so for instance, it's really interesting because we have electronic um, uh, online banking now through the web to our individual yeah. banks. And those banks all have shared the SWIFT system, the ACH system, all these other systems through these uh, APIs. Now, having worked on the other side of it, on the organization side of it, where those APIs are created and tested, I know that banks are seriously paranoid. But they, don't do it. they only extend that paranoia out one ring around them. So Equifax being two or three rings out and dealing with banks at a, at a different level is not under the same kind of stringent um, requirements for security that, say, credit card companies may be, right? Where they're actually reaching in through the ACH to hit the, your debit and debit your, your account. And so, so Equifax was more open that way. But it's, the mere openness of it, I think, is, it, is the big vulnerability at this stage because we don't know, and Equifax is never going to tell us, where else these crackers went once they penetrated and controlled the Equifax system. Nor do we yet know that it's been scrubbed clean. All we know is that they have discovered that they were hacked. <laughs> that's, that's just the beginning of the process. So it's, it's not good. Now, you know, um, uh, to that point, I actually have run into a couple of um, companies that are going to start doing uh, risk analysis uh, through the blockchain, and providing results through blockchain controlled uh, access to risk analysis results. And they're going to have a, they've got a kind of an interesting system because they will store hashed uh, uh, encrypted um, pointers into a, an encrypted database on the blockchain. And you'll know as the uh, sort of victim, your credit rating being within there uh, in this little, little hashed uh, algorithm uh, pointer, uh, but you'll also be the owner of it. And they'll be in a position to tell you each and every time anybody, even a cracker through some other system, uh, accesses your uh, credit report, positive or negative, and you'll have the ability through the blockchain to edit some aspects of that within the hashed code. So this was a good idea. This is a, in response to the Equifax and the, and the corruption that was exposed to uh, in the process of the, the crack there. You know, you've got a company that doesn't report it for five months. It takes them that long to be sure they were cracked. I mean, what's going well, on? Well, the, 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 the Wall Street Journal puts it as since it was made public. You know, we know that many of these breaches are, are not reported for months after. I Sounds like the DNC. Well, <laughs> my, our, our payroll, my, my company's payroll co uh, provider was hacked. We were six weeks out before we were even told about this. Yeah. Now, all that time passed before the targets of this, which is ultimately the individual people who have records in these systems, are affected. So they're not moving swiftly. It seems to me like there's a, a lot of ass covering and a lot of hoping that they can clean all this up before they have to. They're, at what level they're required to disclose it, I don't know, but I know there is a level where the law kicks in and they must disclose publicly and then they must re begin remediation process. So it's, it's a mess and there's a part of me that responds in a number of different ways. One is the social engineering side of this, which is, is this mm -hmm. a run to finally fully compromise an already wounded beast in the, in the banking system? It could be, okay. Uh, it was very sophisticated relative yeah. to Equifax, yeah. that's clear. All right, it caught them unawares that you would also have to postulate that it's not a in, uh, single individual. And no. again, this is a, a postulate, right? 
Uh, cracking could be done at an individual level. You could get into Equifax or virtually anywhere. But an individual is going to have very little use for 143 million records. Uh, it just does not work that way. The individual crackers that are uh, operating and making a living at it these days are working on three and five and 10,000, maybe 100,000 records at a time where there's something manageable within there for them to sell. So for mm -hmm. instance, the guy cracks in. Let's say that, okay, there's two parts of Equifax. There's the data they hold on everybody, but then there's also the data they hold on their customers who give them credit cards yeah. to get, get a look at the credit reports and that kind of thing. That's a much smaller record, but let's just assume that, that the cracker was actually after the credit card numbers in the Equifax uh, uh, database. Even then, uh, what they usually do is they manufacture credit cards. It's really easy. You get a machine, you punch these things out, and they make them off for these numbers. Yeah. But you you do that in three and five and ten and hundred thousand units, uh, or you sell the data. So when you're dealing in millions of records, uh, there's either this was either a crack for hire right, where someone wanted it done and paid to have it done for a specific yeah. reason, which may not be. Uh, apparent to us because maybe the crack and the record theft was merely to cover what was really going on. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it could, it could be a situation where somebody had a lot of money and they said, well, I want to have my credit rating fixed. And so the guy cracks into Equifax, fixes the credit rating. And in order to make sure that it doesn't ever show up, he just steals a bunch of records to create the, the illusion of a, of a meaningful hack. We just have no idea what's going on. But we do know that they took a number of months before telling anybody. And if in fact the data was compromised, you only need weeks for the majority of those people to also be compromised in months is, is, is just, you might as well not even tell anybody. You know, at that level, their, their data has been exposed, their credit card information exposed for months. So, you know, it's a, it's a very curious situation there. And there's obviously something um, more uh, under the covers than we're seeing. It's yeah. not just simply a, uh, uh, a corporate screw up. No, and it's not a small group here. I, and I, I, you know, they've pulled back from pointing the gun at Russian or Eastern European hackers or China. Uh, but they're certainly not owning up on the fact that this is this has the smell of a, a larger syndicate to me in terms of being able to manage this level of data and this big of a target. So I was shocked at the size of the records as it's well. Huge. It's, it's, that, it's, that's what I thought, too, was that, you know, this was organized. 143 million. Yeah, that's that's nearly a third of the population. Well, I, I was I wasn't thinking of it that way. I was thinking of, of it in the number of of terabytes it would take yeah. to copy the database down, and how fast that could how be. How fast it has to come! You need a hell of a connection for that, and right? And that would be noticed. Yeah. So you've got to have a, a hell of a lot of time to do it slowly. Otherwise, and what about <laughs> what about the idea of this being something orchestrated to bring in further levels of like regulation or switch switch the hands of who controls these kinds of. Uh, you know, things or, you know, who has, who has access to what, I mean, I could just see, I, again, I don't know that much about any of this kind of stuff, but isn't this the perfect kind of thing that, bring, that allows so, uh, the government to issue a new level of regulatory control, or let's say even that they want to switch this from the hands of the credit, agent, the, you know, the credit agencies that are dealing with it now to a government kind of control of this. Or, or even a new player in the government involved. Okay, we saw that in the 1890s where the railroads were coming in and the um, uh, certain uh, material handlers and, and movers basically uh, bribed government to shift more and more business to railroads and away from uh, overseas around, around the continent shift, yeah. Uh, shipping. So, yeah, it, it's certainly doable that way. Interesting. Another, another aspect of it, though, um, is that... Um, the com competition, okay, it could be easily seen as an attack on Equifax in order to shift economic movement, which it already has, to either to some other company or maybe even to another platform. Except for the fact that, that I know these guys are not anywhere near organized enough, it would be a perfect tactic for somebody involved in blockchain that would then come along and proffer a solution where the trust aspect was removed and you didn't have to mess with Equ Equifax and so on. And uh, you could, you know, it'd be expensive to, to pay for something like this in the way of a crack. So there is that. Whoever did it uh, either had a personal uh, skin in the, in the operation or was paid a whole lot of money to organize this thing. But 
they do this. This is the weird part of this, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, competitors are using Facebook uh, against each other in the personal care products business. So uh, let's just choose uh, something, um, you know, at home uh, ear piercing. I don't know that even such a thing exists, okay? <laughs> uh, but let's say that, but let's say we have two companies in the at home ear piercing business that's selling devices. And you've got company A and they're advertising on Facebook. Company B goes on out and wants to drive up all of the all of the costs it can for company A and put them out of business so that it can be the dominant player in this the little niche. And what it does is it sets up a, a dummy advertising account and gives it a little bit of dollars to feed it for Facebook and then goes and bids up the same kind of words that company A is buying for its advertising. Thus, company A is now spending two and three and five and 10 times what it should. They basically match the algorithm and try and drive up the cost of company A. And this is going, and this is, makes fantastic money for Facebook. Facebook loves this kind of action and they're not ever going to restrict it at all. But that level of um, corporate skullduggery is a huge business uh, layer within the US. I mean, I know of companies that that pay people to be professional trolls, other companies that write algorithms to, you know, jack up advertising rates on Google for your, against your competitors by sniffing out the keywords they're using and all of this kind of thing. So uh, it wouldn't surprise me a bit that Equifax was, that it was a crack for hire for whatever reason. One of the reasons potentially could be a business proposition and we'll know as it goes along. Uh, it's rather interesting that they're losing top executives and we'll see if the company crumbles and just exactly, you know, Kue Bene, who's going to benefit from this, right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I think the conspiratorial side of me believes that there's something much bigger and afoot. I just can't make sense of it right now, except that it looks to me like it's going to shift this game rather quickly. I think Oh, Lord, help us. Once Congress gets involved, who knows what they're going to do. That's what I'm saying, right? If you want to if you exacerbate a problem, you have a congressional hearing. And, of course, that will, that'll, that, that'll that will solve bring, everything. That will bring, bring no truth. And, as usual, we may, no. we may have to wait for the WikiLeaks dump. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, also, okay. it's also, it's changed markets, okay, already. Yeah. So it's impacted the real estate market in the U.S. Yes. in a very significant way. And it's going to continue to do so. A lot of banks are, I was just talking to a guy today about that, about banks not lending and the uh, issues that they were running into. And it's all related to risk analysis. So yeah. it's already well, The other side of it is that banks haven't really been lending. Well, in, any real, in, in any real sense, I mean, to their, to their top tier prime borrowers which are largely corporate level and very high income people but lending into the mainstream the middle class which at least one time was the bulwark of this whole thing that's been dead for years and now well, it's, the, it's part of the bond cycle though. it's it, yeah yeah there's nowhere to go with it correct and it, it won't recover until there is a fundamental huge crash and it will probably never recover because now we have an alternative which is cryptocurrencies in lieu of banks yeah. So there's a new thing called salt lending. And so uh, it's a company, it's a friend of mine is uh, involved with it, uh, some peripheral level. But um, what they do is they take your cryptocurrencies as collateral and loan you fiat. And uh, they've got a nice little algorithm. If the cryptocurrencies drop in value below the amount of outstanding fiat, they sell off just enough to pay for the, the thing. They don't, you know, harvest your account and the whole deal. So uh, there's all these alternatives to bank lending showing up because banks aren't lending because the bond cycle has wiped out the middle class, which was their primary customer base. And then they had the um, liar loans. And if you're breathing kind of loans that led to the subprime crises, and then they transferred the subprime crises over to subprime automobiles. That has crashed out, and now we're seeing all of the, the car dealerships start to go the way of the malls. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. If you can, then, if you can just entertain me for one more sure. turn here on the questioning, because I've heard you talk about salt before. In, in, is this a platform that's going to enable people to deal more with each other? without so much of this middle layer of banks and 
uh, consumer reporting agencies and things like that. Are we heading towards a time when we're going to build trust in a different way? Well, we're removing trust from the system. You don't okay. have to trust anymore, right? And that's why it actually works because in that essence, well, in this essence, right, in the, the period that we're in now, you have to trust the banks, the middlemen, and so on. And as we see, they're not doing a good job and they're letting everybody down. And so we can't trust them anymore. And so we've developed a trustless system that I think over time will actually restore trust on a global scale. And the trustless aspect of this is that on the blockchain, if, if I put my cryptocurrencies into a collateral uh, for a loan and get issued fiat by a, a smart robot that directs the, through an ACH connection right into my bank account, there's no trust involved. Once the, the cryptos are locked up in the account, they don't have to trust me because they've got control of them, right? And as, as I pay back the loan, I don't have to trust them to apply it without sucking out everything in fees and stuff because I'm dealing with a smart robot piece of software. And so I've eliminated any trust aspect. It's performance at that level. So if you perform, trust is not required. And then trust is no longer an issue at all. Makes sense? Yeah, it does. And so it's a performance-based system, not a meritocracy per se, where you get merit for some perceived benefits that you're providing to the society. Here, it's, it's a performance-based system where you get benefits for performing. And so it's, gonna, it's for those people that I guess really want to work and all the whole crypto thing, right? Because it's performance at all levels, if you look at it. Uh, everything from performances as a cryptocurrency to all of the ramifications all the way around. There's another outfit called Populous. Populous is, is jumping into a market that banks have dominated for centuries, <coughs> which is uh, factoring or lending on a month-to-month -month basis just enough money for your business to make it to the next month, right. to meet expenses, make yeah. the payroll, and so on. Factoring is re usually done as a percentage of um, invoices that you've got outstanding of people actually paying you money. So they're just taking a portion of your cash flow and a, and a chunk of profits. But that accounts for 28% of global banking profits, not business, profits. profits. And so they're really harvesting people in the factoring business. And they're harvesting people based on all different kinds of credit or, or, or criteria that are not really valid. So you've got hardworking people in Indonesia and in India that even if they were relocated to London, and so it's not geography, it's the people. Even if these individuals of high net worth and everything were relocated to London, they're going to pay a higher amount every month for factoring simply because their skin is melanin rich and they're in a less melanin rich environment, right? And it has to do with the inbuilt uh, prejudice of the British system, but at the same time, it points out the nature of this at a global level. And these inbuilt prejudices are costing us all huge efficiencies. And so these, these businesses would be much more productive if they didn't have to pay an extra 12% annually for their factoring business just because of who they are. And so Populous removes that because it is peer-to-peer -peer financing at a factoring level. And so getting back to the issue of the loans, salt lending is peer to peer, but it's got a central, it's got a company that organizes it and runs the smart contracts and stuff. There are many other peer to peer lending uh, systems that are also uh, arising now, some of which require that you buy their uh, proprietary token in order to participate. Others, it's just, uh, you know, you have to put fiat into an account that then you dump in and, and it's into the platform and so on. All different kinds of schemes working at the peer-to-peer -peer level. And we notice something instantly. All of a sudden, interest rates for individuals, even on short-term credit, drop hugely. Uh, interest rates in the um, uh, rake-off industries in, in England could be 5,000% uh, per year on short-term loans. These, these are loan shark kind of guys. And why would you want to deal with them if you can just hop online and say, you know, I've got a 60-day need or 90-day or need for this amount of money, establish a relationship with a smart robot and begin from there, knowing that if you don't perform, that's it. <laughs> there's no longer, you know, there's no appeal to this. You just, you're, you're, you're building your own credit, so to speak, in a negative way by non-performance on these individual smart contracts and performance on the smart contracts will be stored in a risk evaluating contract uh, or robot somewhere else. 
Now, and But at that level, within the way in which they're going to store these things, it's not like Equifax. It's not like they can come on in and take out 143 million records in a meaningful fashion. They may get 143 million hash codes that would lead them to nothing. So yeah, cryptocurrencies offer us an, an interesting way out of a number of the problems that we face as a species. Um, and people just don't get it. We're actually on the cusp of, a, of an extinction level event for humans at any number of different levels, at any number of different sources, okay? So everything from energy, from the amount of energy we get out of oil to energy coming around the sun. Uh, for instance, uh, for years, we've had this thing about sun disease showing up in my data sets, right? And I'm here to tell you that all up and down the West Coast, it's officially reported in Washington State anyway, but all up and down the West Coast, people are running into mental hospitals that we have the, the largest number of self-admissions ever seen in the state of Washington into all kinds of psychiatric and mental facilities now. And I'm saying it's uh, at least partially related to the um, unknown energies that no one talks about that are coming around the sun and impacting our planet and, and affecting our species. And so we've got all of this stuff going on um, and very little of it is actually good, but cryptos are good because they offer us a way out of the system that's also contributing to the fact that we're sort of stuck. You know, I mean, we've really been stuck in this system for like 30 years. Well, it's interesting you brought up the sun, so maybe we can definitely segue from this and wheel into our chosen to topic tonight, which is time. But I'd like to get your take since you brought up the sun on this eclipse that we had and any possible effects you see, there's a lot of woo-woo around it. And frankly, I saw a lot of woo-woo in it in terms of my own take on it. So what, what is Cliff High's take on the, on the eclipse and the aftermath of that? Well, we're still in the aftermath, still yes. living through yes. it. I mean, we're in this uh, first wave of it. Uh, it's being reinforced again next couple of days. Yeah. And then again in the first part of October, maybe it'll wane a little bit thereafter, but it's what accounted for the Mexico earthquake. It's what accounted for the uh, hurricanes we've got. I don't think the hurricanes are being steered or, or um, magnified in this case, right? We've got a situation where people think, and they still are reporting, oh, oh, it moved over some warm water and it's getting stronger. And it's like, no, guys, you know, uh, hurricanes don't exist because of warm water. They exist because of electricity coming in in vast quantities into our ionosphere uh, that has to ground out. And if it forms at these particular nexus points, if you were to imagine, for instance, that the Earth was a sphere, right? Inside that sphere is a Merkaba. Uh, you're familiar with that? The yeah. tetrahedron mm -hmm. inside a tetrahedron? Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, those would touch that sphere at its specific points. I have a, one of those things lying around here, a globe, I, and I've got the Merkaba points actually marked on it. And this I did years ago. And sure enough, one of them is where hurricanes form right off of the coast of Africa. All hurricanes forming at this central point. And it has very little to do with uh, that being the spot that they're easiest to steer them from or create or anything like that. It has to do with the fact that, that at the oblate bulge of this uh, a spherical Earth, that Merkaba point touches from the inside such that it's the furthest one out, so to speak, from the center, okay? If you, if you were to think of the Earth as a sphere, it's not actually a sphere, it's an oblate spheroid. It's flat on, on the top and the bottom and sort of bulgy and lumpy around the middle like most of us. And then it's got, little, it's got a little point there where the Merkaba comes out and touches you know, the inside of the skin, so to speak. And that just so happens that Africa is so huge and such a giant landmass and the way it's in shape that the point at which that Merkaba comes in and touches is just off the coast of Africa. And that's where these hurricanes form. And it's because that is the shortest distance between the inner Merkaba and the ionosphere. And so that's where all of the electricity up here decides it can get down to earth at the shortest distance distance. This also is an aspect of uh, Schumann resonances, and there's many of them. So if anybody tells you the Schumann resonance is changing, which you one? should ask them, well, which one? You know, because <laughs> actually that's not ever changing. What's going on is we're more aware of one over the other. But anyway, so these hurricanes are forming there because all that electricity spirals in, it's got to ground out. Well, then the easiest place for it to ground out is the Caribbean, Florida, 
uh, and North America because of the crystalline structure of the North American plate. All it's trying to do is to dissipate the electricity into the ground as all electricity wants to, to uh, neutralize itself. And in the process, our planet uses these hurricanes to transfer heat from the equator to the north and to try and equalize heat distribution around the planet. So it, in my opinion, the reason we've had such nasty hurricanes and are gonna see some really other nastier ones is because of the amount of electricity that's coming off of the sun and the fact that uh, pro at the time of the um, 2003 Banda Aci uh, quake, we lost 15% of our upper atmosphere. It was blown off in a solar expulsion. We've had a recent another CME, which also blew off some more of our atmosphere, redu thus reducing the distance between the ionosphere and that point of the Merkaba that the electricity wants to ground out or start trying to ground out on. And so when hurricanes strengthen by going back over water, it's because there's no ability for the electricity to, to ground out over the water and more of the electricity keeps pouring in from the ionosphere until the hurricane wanders back onto the land and grounds out through the crystalline structure of the rock and all the metal and everything we've got lying around. It's the same deal with tornadoes. You ever notice how tornadoes love to eat mobile homes? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it's because those are a nice, quick, easy ground. You can see that shiny aluminum waiting to dissipate electricity if you were a tornado. You can see it miles away. You know, it's, it's drawing you. It's actually pulling you there. And there was a guy I know who, who lived in, um, I want to say South Carolina, but maybe it was North Carolina, that had mobile homes in a mobile home park that had been hit by a tornado. And, um, and so he set up uh, lightning arresters all over the, the perimeter of the property. And they have not had tornadoes in that oh. section of the county ever since he's done that because he's constantly dissipating electricity into fence wire that then takes it down into the ground. <laughs> so just, you know, practical use for a little bit of knowledge here. Sounds like something you would do. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds like something I would do, yeah. Uh, but I, I've played around with the solar stuff and all that electricity uh, way too much, although, I, no, I won't go into that <laughs> anyway. Uh, but... Um, Getting back to the sun, though, and the time aspect of this, it, it has been a long time we've had this, the sun disease stuff showing up. And it wasn't so much that the sun itself was going to be diseased as it was going to cause humans to go a little sparky, mm -hmm. okay, where you might find a person in the middle of us. And the data sets would present us with these images of a guy standing in a, in a um, uh, intersection, cars around him beeping like mad, and he's just standing there sort of drooling on himself, not really sensate. Other people around him are, are fine. Those other people walking around are seemingly okay. Some people might be feeling some odd effects, but not enough that there is noticeable. And then someone helps him across the street. And this, this phenomenon grows, and it has to do with people that are sensitive to whatever it is this energy is that's pouring yeah. out around the sun. And we're going to find out who these individuals are as they experience this. And I think a lot of them, these early experiencers, are now checking themselves into our mental yeah. hospitals. Yeah, I was going to ask, uh, a friend and I were having a conversation last night. She was talking about how she feels like the sun makes her tired. Like she feels like tired all day long. And then when it gets sundown, she goes inside at night and whatever, then she feels better. Um, but also, I was, you said that about the mental hospitals. Do you think that these are so... Um, it's this, it's so, these energies are so intense that it could cause somebody who would never normally do something like this to commit suicide? I don't know. Suicide's an interesting thing separately, okay? Yeah. I can, I can say that we could say it step back a level, right? And we could say that, yes, I would agree with this statement that the sun is and the energy slipping around the sun at the moment are so intense that they will cause individuals that have never before manifested aberrant behavior to do so, okay? okay? Now, how, how far in terms of degree the aberrant behavior would go towards something like suicide, I don't know. Suicide is a... Um, uh, it's something that relates to not only this life, but past lives. Yeah. Okay. So, so I wouldn't consider it to be within the category of other ordinary, uh, <laughs> other ordinary aberrant yeah. behavior. <laughs> right. Right. So I, I would question that. Okay. Uh, but, but nonetheless, I would say that if such a person was, um, uh, considering or on the edge, uh, for suicide, uh, that yeah, these energies could indeed trip you over that. But if I'm, if, let's like, also acknowledge, 
something else, or let's say something else here. Let me just put it this way. If you go to the Cliff High YouTube channel, mm -hmm. there's a YouTube uh, video I did a long time ago. And it's uh, things for people to consider, or, or it's, it's thoughts for people who are considering suicide. Oh, okay? okay. It's a nice little video for anybody that may be contemplating this. Yeah. Uh, because it gives you a different perspective on, on the contemplation aspect and in all aspects of it. So we needn't go into it now. Yeah. It goes on for a half an hour. Check it out. Yeah. Thing. yeah. So I, I guess maybe the, the more appropriate question is could possibly some of the symptoms caused by these energies of the sun irritate a person into a situation where maybe they'd be willing to do something completely out of their character, such as suicide? Yes. Okay, yes, that, that, I would cert I would certainly agree with that. That these are are energies that are extra character motivating, and mm. that's why I think we're going to see uh, individuals as well as group psychoses develop over these next few years. As mm. and this is a subset or a a part of the um, existential threat that we're facing at this time. Gotcha. Now, now it could be, or at least we can also say that there may be a correlation. All right. In a data mining sense, there may be a correlation between the energies that we're feeling now and the energies that uh, we're at this, the same uh, type of energy, just not the same level of intensity that affected the Mongolian uh, mass migration. Okay. Okay. And people say that the Mongolian people, uh, okay, historians say the Mongolian people went mad and they killed so many people on the earth that uh, they altered the carbon footprint of the time. Uh -huh. Okay, so this is true. Yeah. Some aspect of it is true, whether madness is, is uh, there or not, but it is true they killed so many people that they uh, almost threatened the, the non-Mongolian species existence uh, within their, their part of universe. And they did alter the carbon footprint of the planet and they were, it was happening at, under exactly the same kind of conditions we have now, except the earth had a, a larger atmosphere that we think and was more protected so they may oh, not have the now. level of than now then <laughs> yeah. yeah and so we're getting we're getting a, a bigger hit now yeah, yeah. wow and so yeah we, we're gonna we're gonna have all those kind of weird things going on it doesn't yeah. help too by the way that humans are participating by doing weird things like shoving vast quantities of electricity into the planet right so consider the hurricane issue right hurricanes don't like going to spain or gibraltar they don't like grounding out there. The way in which the rotation of the planet is, it's easier for them to spin counterclockwise and head off to North America. But even if they wanted to go to Europe to ground out, now they wouldn't be able to because CERN is shoving so much electricity into, into Europe yeah. that it's actually altering the electrical balance of the planet. So, yeah. so that's causing issues. And it, what happens if we get to a point where there's so much electricity in the ground that they, we can't ground out a hurricane? Does it go and become a perpetual hurricane bouncing off the North Pole and back down to the South Pole and devastating in between, you know, like a super pong or something? What, what you just said made me think of a question. I don't even know if I know how to ask this question, but I'm going to try. And it relates to what we were talking about a few minutes ago, the Equifax. You've heard them talk with these like um, D-Wave computers and yeah. these Alice computers, no, Wake computers that are related to CERN, that they are trying to get information from other realities, other dimensions, and bring it back in here and take ones from this reality and put it into one, other ones. Could this Equifax thing, because of the sheer size of it, be the kind of thing that would happen through one of those computers where something from some intelligence from another dimension, another reality is, is, is pulling information through? And for them, that amount is not a lot, right? And they, can, they have the computing pro power to be able to get through <laughs> right. that really quickly. Um, I could dispute that on a lot of different levels, okay. but what I would ask is, what the hell would they do it with it? You know, <laughs> do they have credit cards over there? <laughs> well, it's just one of those things. Like, they, have you heard that guy, uh, Jordy Rose or Gordy Rose, whatever his name is, and some of these others who talk about like what the how these systems work and how they're trying to essentially take information from other oh, realities? Sure. Okay, sure, so, yeah. Even if they were just, let's just say, having a test run, right? Let's see what we can <laughs> grab. You know what I mean? And, and, and they take a chunk here and they take a chunk there. And to them, uh, the amount of th things that we think of as a lot of terabytes, to them, that's just a little bit, right? I, I hear what you're saying. And in fact, if you were going to postulate that, they may even have a way where it's like um, uh, the inside of the TARDIS. 
right? They yes. only have to grab one bite to get it all, that kind yes. of thing, because of hyperdimensional. Yes. But, but that brings me back to one of this, the big issues that I was wrestling with that I was going to try and involve your mind with, which is this time. Okay. And so I'll go into, I'm going to read okay. you something, okay? It, it's not very, not very long, but it's about time. Uh, I'm going to skip around in this uh, little tiny uh, four, four paragraph uh, um, piece of um, writing from the Anderson Institute. Anderson is a, a doctor, a physicist who deals in time. Yeah, Dr. Who's David Anderson. Time, right, who's ba basically disappeared, right? Time, <laughs> disappeared. time domain technology? Correct, yeah, correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay yeah. so now he says on his site, he says, time is a measured or measurable period, a continuum that lacks spatial dimensions. And time is a philosophical interest and also the subject of mathematic and, sub and scientific investigation. Then I'm going to do a big jump here. And it's like... Um, uh, let me see where it was about. Okay. Uh, among prominent philosophers, there are two distinct viewpoints on time. Now, we'll dispute that, okay? He's going to say there's two, only two, but I'm going to present you with many more in different ways to look at it here. Uh, one view is that time is uh, part of a fundamental structure of the universe, a dimension in which events occur in sequence. Time travel, in this view, becomes a possibility as other times persist like frames in a movie, that are still on the reel, not being shown at the moment, okay? Uh, this was the view held by Sir Isaac Newton, and it became known as the realist view, uh, that so time exists independent of uh, everything else, just like space. The opposing view, which is held by people like Immanuel Kant and uh, Gottfried Leibniz and uh, other guys, um, is that uh, time does not refer to any kind of a container, Okay, there is no container, no frames or, or anything like that that hold time at all. Thus, we don't move through time in any way, shape, or form. And that time is instead a part of a fundamental intellectual structure, the same as space and numbers that exist only in our heads, basically. Okay, now, and so in that sense, time can't be traveled. The, the past does not exist anymore. And time is uh, neither an event or a thing. Uh, and thus itself is not really measurable. That what we're measuring is, you know, some mechanical device or electronic device or, or crystal pulsation and not really time itself. All of those things are accurate, okay? It's, it's perfectly true that we've never measured time. We're measuring time the same way we measure a, a heart rate by taking a pulse, okay? The, the pulse is not the actual heartbeat. Um, so, uh, and then we get to some interesting thinking here, which you just brought up. All right. And that is the statement in here about how, uh, the opposing view is that time does not refer to a container, but is part of a fundamental intellectual construct. And I think we can falsify this statement and thus prove uh, in a intellectual differential calculus kind of a way that, uh, uh, some things that are time and some things that are not time. Because we can note right now, we can ask ourselves um, some, some interesting questions here. Does time affect biology or does biology affect time? Okay, did dinosaurs have time? Do chickens have time? All right, so, so let's just examine this with chickens for a moment. Uh, chickens, uh, what would they measure time by? What does a human measure time by in the absence of mechanical clocks and stuff? What did our ancestors measure time by? Well, they measured them by predictable events that they knew would reoccur in the future or events that had their own time uh, spool, so to speak, which is like giving birth to someone, all right? And then you watch them age. <clears throat> so you know time in the aging of the, and even if you don't have mirrors to see your own self age, you would notice that this other individual is aging that you gave birth to, right? or the, you know, whose uh, life began when yours was at a certain point. And so we at least have the observational tools to measure time absent a mechanical form. Now, would chickens be able to do this? Probably not, not only being bird brains, but I'm of the opinion that biology and time are inextricably linked mm -hmm. and that time doesn't exist for the chickens uh, the same way it does for mammals because chickens are egg layers. And thus, as egg layers, they're going to have a clutch of eggs. Those chickens will hatch and go off. 
they'll have another clutch of eggs, but the chicken itself does not in any way mark time, couldn't mark time mentally in an intellectual construct from one clutch to another by watching the various little hens grow up. Nor does that chicken have any gestation hormones. Hormones, I think, are a real key to time. Mm -hmm. And that, that gestation hormones in the male as well as the female, because males have gestation hormones, albeit entirely different set when they're involved in that process, right? Uh, in the process of pregnancy and birth. And the gestation hormones on males are triggered off of testosterone versus the estrogen. So it's, it's complementary, but they both, I think, bring in the ability to gain wisdom and time. Uh, and that time itself is required for both of all for all of us to be not only mature but to be able to gain wisdom in our in our thinking and then to understand ourselves enough to be able to uh, express that wisdom through through the consciousness now here's the thing about this I, I do a lot of thinking about time because of the nature of my work I'm trying to identify when the words will appear and what they're forecasting and so on and so consequently, I keep coming back to these various different people like Cozy Rev and some of the other experimenters in time, such as Anderson. Anderson has never claimed that he's done time travel as George Norrie and Art Bell think, okay? He can't go into the past. I know this. Now, I know this because the past, as uh, Newton uh, thought, uh, as is frames in a, in a movie, does not exist. And I have absolute proof that it doesn't exist because of consciousness. So because we can imagine to ourselves, all right, so Marty McFly is going to get into the, into the car and go zipping back to 1985. Well, there's kind of a problem. A lot of people that uh, existed in 1985 died in 1985 or 1990, and their consciousness is no longer in this realm. Okay, so... It, can we, are we to expect that consciousness exists forever in, an, in a perpetual constant prison of living through all of its previous uh, lives and, and moments all the time? I don't think so. I think consciousness is, a, is able to record time because it is the thing that is actually experiencing time and without consciousness to experience it, time per se doesn't exist the way that we actually experience it as humans. So the consciousness that's in a chicken, while it's recording time, that chicken is not conscious of the time the way we are. And if I'm correct about this, other dimensions don't exist. There are no 12 other dimensions. There's no other dimension in which there's corporeal matter that, that is out of phase with ours where right. they're gonna steal our data or whatever. Now, that's not to say that there's not intelligences that we cannot perceive, because I'm quite certain those exist. And I know that they exist because we've only got four senses. And I know that those four senses have very limited ranges. And thus, I know that there's x-ray beings could exist, and I can't see x-ray. So I'd have no way of knowing that they exist. And so there's all different kinds of spectra that I cannot see in the materium that I cannot experience. And I know that, that the potential exists for there to be some form of intelligence or consciousness that expresses itself within those areas that the spectra don't pick up. So this would be all of the, um, the, the unseen entities that could attach to you, right? This would be the place from which channelers come. This would be the place from which channelers get their information, not from some spaceship a thousand miles over the earth with a corporeal being beaming these thoughts down, but from the fact that you opened up your mind and allowed these unseen uh, thoughts, if you will, that are persistent to enter in your mind, and they're going to take some of your life energy, and they'll tell you any kind of a lie that, that will continue to get you to connect with them so that they can keep taking your life energy away mm -hmm. from you. And channeling, I personally think, is a very dangerous activity for individuals to do. Yeah, and that it, it really affects your, yeah. your next life in a serious way. Wow, you just said a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. I, my first question, just kind of what you ended there with, and then we'll maybe work our way backwards. There were so many things. You talk, so you were saying if other, dimen other dimensions don't exist. Could it possibly be that the thing that we think of as other dimensions are just different layers of our consciousness. 
that we are sort of working through. And because human beings and because, uh, because of our, in some ways our nature, but also because of the ways that we've been uh, programmed and whatever, we have this tendency to want to externalize everything. We want to look for things outside of ourselves. So <clears throat> rather than the various layers of our consciousness being those things you were talking about, the future, the past, and all that, the time, basically, different layers of our consciousness, we're um, uh, more inclined, whether it be naturally or by other means, to, to, to think of it as something outside of ourselves, therefore other dimension, because dimension also sort of implies a little bit place, and we tend to like to uh, think of things that way, like we like to know where something is, like we like to know what, you know, that kind of thing. So that, that way, and the people who are running things, they recognize that this is a fundamental fault or error that humans make. And so they create all of these big outside boogeymen or outside powers for us to, be, to basically anchor the idea that all of those things are outside of ourself instead of them th being things that are inside of our consciousness. Like, I don't know, I, you know, I know you've, you hear a lot of the shows we've done, but one of the things that Randy and I talk about quite a bit and it, some, in some ways we've hammered in on it, in other ways maybe not as much as we should. I'm of the opinion that the secret space program is actually about exploring consciousness, about creating a space inside of people's heads to program, or or or, or to uh, that that you know that uh, could, could be that the secret space program is also what they're calling brain mapping, right? The thing that they're trying to convince us is out there is really inside of ourselves, and that's what they're really interested, in. and that's why there's so much mind control and whatnot wrapped in with that. And so the whole, all of these external places are really um, a, that's the big lie that, that, that they're getting us to focus on places outside of us instead of levels within inside of ourselves. Okay. So um, let's start with some sort of definitions, right? Or some perspectives. Okay. My perspective is that uh, consciousness is inviolate. All right. It's like space. All right. First off, we know that space is unaffected by matter inside it. All okay. Right? And we also know we cannot define space without def the matter from which to spring our definitions. So how do you define space absent matter? So consciousness is kind of a funny thing because you can't expand your consciousness. You can't change it. It simply is. Even the word is very interesting and unique. Many other cultures do not have the concept. Okay. You have to let that sink in for a second. They yeah. know they have the idea, they can translate the word. And when they translate the word, it may not be, there may be a quite a bit that's lost in translation. Okay. It's a very interesting word in the, in the English language. And it has ramifications that many other cultures mm -hmm. don't have. Yeah. However, Sanskrit does have concepts uh, for consciousness and they've got a language, um, a history that's about 5,000 years older and longer than English. So they've got some people that really thought about consciousness then. And of course, all the yogis, they go on into it in a serious way and think about consciousness. And some of the things we know are that consciousness can't change ever. And we know this and you can prove it to yourself because you go to sleep at night and you wake up in the morning and there is still the ever present you. Right. No matter what you feel, you every single morning and when they knock you out for surgery or in a fight or something and you come back to it you may feel damaged and broken in the body but the you is still there and it's still the same you that that was knocked out and so consciousness doesn't change and if you take lots of psychedelic drugs even really huge levels of shamanic psychedelic drugs you cannot change your consciousness it proves to you that consciousness is inviolate. It is the fundamental nature of everything. Consciousness yeah. is, and that's the only thing we can really say about it. We can so in that, in that way, it's similar to space. So that would be, a, right? So that's an Correct. easy, that's why, wouldn't that sort of lend to this idea of being able to kind of- Internalize, externalize. About? Correct. Yes. Now, now I have, to, I have to qualify this and say, I go out with those night vision goggles and I see those bastards trucking around up there and doing stuff in a human fashion, right? I can right. say, look, those three ships are delivering something to that other big ship over there. They're only going to stay a little bit and then they're going to head back over towards that constellation and go out of my sight. Sure enough, they do. 
And so I can see logistic movements and so on. So I think externalized humans in corporeal form are in charge of those ships, whether they're there inside the ship or not, whether it's a drone right. or not, there's, there's human consciousness that's controlling it independent of that. So in that sense, I do not think that those things exist within my consciousness. Right. Now, okay, also, I know that my consciousness doesn't hold things, okay? It doesn't hold uh, aggravation or things from previous lives. My consciousness is well aware uh, that it has lived uh, in the past, that there have been other this body experiences, and I've reincarnated. But, but the, the karmic baggage that, that we think of as being part of our consciousness or subconsciousness, I don't place in consciousness at all because none of that stuff affects my consciousness. When I die, I'll go to a metempsychosis and spend some period of immeasurable time in various different states that are, that are in this world called heaven and hell and a deep sleep. And then I will be reborn into a new period of time. In the period of, of, that existed in temporal reality while I'm dead, I won't have any recognition of or knowledge of. I'll just be suddenly into this new time in the new body and have to contend with it from that point forward. However, the consciousness now is quite assured that when it's in that new body, even then that consciousness will recognize that it had lived in the past, if not recognizing that it lived in this body, right? So, uh, but so I think it, living... correct me if I'm, are you saying that you don't, you don't, envision or understand there to be a non-physical expression of consciousness per se no i'm not saying that at all I've oh, actually, okay okay yeah, no 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 I, explicitly there are non-corporeal forms of consciousness okay. exists and right. actually my my thinking is very much like um you could use it as an analogy to the great uh, thing about brahman okay brahman the ultimate god goes and dreams dreams us all into existence for several eternities gets tired of that dream wakes up looks around all of reality has died we're all dead and then he goes back to sleep and dreams into existence another reality okay? yeah in that kind of a story consciousness is brahman in the sense that consciousness exists uh, outside of before and forever on the other side of the materium the materium is just that place where matter exists, where we all think that things right, are right. solid, right? And all we are are subsets of, of the grander universal consciousness exploring our individuality as consciousness. And the smart uh, individual in this reality takes advantage of that and knows that this reality is not for certain things. This reality is for learning what to do and what not to do over the course of time uh, through many different lives, becoming better at it over time and progressing and doing, um, uh, gaining less karma each life and using the time more wisely to gain more experience that gains you that next edge in the next life and so on, right? And you find certain expressions of that, I do anyway, because of language. So I actually identify myself um, for tax purposes as a semi-autician. Okay, a semi-autician is someone mm -hmm. who seeks for meaning in life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've just found a way to make it profitable by writing about those experiences and using my method to show other people what might be coming in the future, which is why I think about time a lot. Okay, and, and actually, even the fact that I'm in the future predicting business in no way negates my view that time does not exist as an independent container. Well, it's this not, act this yes, actually right. comes into an interesting aspect of the web bot itself. And I know you've, you've, you've probably responded to this many times, but what is the nature of consciousness affecting the outcome of the web bot and the web bot as a feedback loop into expression of conscious intent or probable futures? Because, yeah, we've actually been there. Okay, that, that was the very first thing. It bit me in the ass, okay? So, so I, I do this, I do this uh, it was like 500 words, maybe 400 words. Very first forecast that I put out that said within 85 days, an event is going to occur and things will never be the same thereafter for any of us living here in the United States. I don't know what that event is, but I think the probability is much more likely to occur within the first part of the, the 85 days than in the latter half and so on. I was, I was screwed up there, right? My numbers were actually reversed because I, I said this on June 12, 2001, and it was actually the 9-11, um, uh, right? The attacks on September the 11th that the data was forecasting. I had it tagged as a military accident. 
because I didn't have terrorism as a word encoded because I'd only gotten into the M's by that time in my lexicon. That was a lot of work. It took me, you know, the better part of a decade to get all the way up to the Z. Uh, so it, so, but you're correct about that. The, the web bot itself, in a, it keeps getting me thinking about time because I saw in the data and knew 85 days before it happened that this thing was going to occur. And, and I didn't know what it was, but I knew the ramifications of it because of the emotional um, values that were within the, showing up within my model space. So, it, and it's tricky, but I screwed up because I wrote about it in the way in which I wrote about it. The very next time I did a run, all I did was find my own stuff coming back and then the whole system blew up and I had to start all over again. And that's when I had to invent this thing called MOM, model of model space, to isolate my own words out of the potential um, uh, data mining so that anything that could have been tainted by my own language was removed so I didn't get into a circuitous loop. And that's why I was actually so pissed at the blue chicken folk because what they had done was basically circumvented all of this very tedious programming that created mom and kept it going. And mom is a huge beast because over time, more people became aware of the web bot, thus more areas had to be isolated. Thus that isolation bag kept growing larger and larger and larger relative to the total amount of data I was mining. So the words then, who had been careful to, to oh, isolate, they put back in. So, okay. Now isn't I it interesting that the web bot in one sense, the, awareness of the thing itself creates almost like an alternative it starts springing off different branches and, and and again you know my expression of this has largely been from a probabilistic universe within a model that says all things which are potential also are likely in a stacked reality system now that's that's abstract, and I and, and I don't want to pull you too far off of the no, core I, I, theme I, here. I get what you're saying. I deny the stacked reality, though. Okay. Because, because of consciousness, because of my view of consciousness and my exploration of it, both with psychedelic drugs and meditation and other things, I'm of the opinion that consciousness. Uh, at this stage, I found all kinds of evidence that suggests that a stacked reality doesn't exist, and therefore other dimensions as such don't exist. Although other parts of the spectra that we're not monitoring with our bodies or our instruments uh, can indeed affect us. And the latter is really interesting because there's so many other spectra we don't monitor with instrumentation mm -hmm. because it's in the woo-woo world. You so know? I, I have a question real quick, I'm yeah. sorry. So, okay, so since you've done like lots of psychedelics and so have I, a lot of the things you experience seem to be futuristic, right? They seem to be futuristic, some sorts of like, um, high technology that also sometimes seem almost biological, like, right, some kind of like futuristic biological technology. So are you saying that like, because, so maybe because of the, we're trapped in this like thing that they've, about linear time, we think it's from the future when really we're just seeing something that is out of our regular spectra of what we can usually visualize, sense, or how we think about something. So rather than that we are, uh, you know, sometimes the psychedelic experience almost seems like quote unquote time travel, right? Like you, mm -hmm. uh, for me, I often feel like I'm communicating with my future self and like having a uh, play back and forth between that. Um, but that's interesting to think about it, that it may be stuff that's already right here, but out of our general sense of the spectra that we normally see, hear, smell, touch, taste. And when we're in the psychedelic state, it seems it's so unusual to us that we are automatically seem to think, okay, well, that's so odd that it can't have happened yet. So it must be from the future. And you're right, actually, though. Okay. okay? But you're, you are correct. You are talking at times with your own consciousness in what you would think of now as a future time. Okay. The reason that that's possible has to do with the nature of consciousness and its connection through our bodies. Okay. So if you take enough psychedelic drugs of the appropriate kind for your particular body, you can momentarily or for 12 hours or whatever, you can sever the connection between your body and consciousness at a level that ties it in with time. And thus yeah. you're free to examine your consciousness or be in your consciousness, which is what actually happens. And you, it's that after the body dissolves state, yes. right? That they're always painting those pictures in the, in the caves of, of. But after that occurs, after you've gone through the little dip and you're, and you're in that state, your consciousness is there. Now your consciousness exists independent of time. All yes. right. Your consciousness knows everything that it's always known. Yeah. And, and it, there's a whole lot of that. Most of it 
99.9999% of it, it doesn't share with this body's incar incarnation. And so when that's going on and you're talking to your consciousness in some other uh, realm or ability or connection to a consciousness, that part of consciousness can respond to you about things that are indeed in your future. Right. Or it can clear up things that are in your past. Yes. Because people that take psychedelics frequently find that the reason for depression goes away. Yeah. They can forgive old enemies. They can forgive themselves for their trespasses. They can get over some of their own karmic issues and so on. And this is why, you know, psychedelic mushrooms and all other kinds of psychedelics are used in uh, fighting depression, which yeah. is basically sometimes can be caused by a buildup of these um, uh, uh, things in this body's uh, collection of, of past thoughts really is what it amounts to, right? Because it's all thoughts. Well, and it's also the, the body is very good at storing trauma. And so- <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah <laughs> that's its right? job. Yeah. yeah. So it's very good at storing trauma. And then when you are in that psychedelic space, it allows you to sort of go through and with your entire consciousness, you know, sort of open to the entire thing, go through and get a perspective on it that is uh, like when you're living in it, everything's so huge and it seems like out of proportion, but when you're using the entire consciousness that you sort of look at it, it puts it into a perspective where you're like, okay, I see now. I understand that what that's a part of, how this happened. It really isn't that large of a thing. It's something I can cope with and deal with and sort of move on from. Um, right. Yeah. And there's yeah. real benefit to that into your next life as well. Totally. A lot of people don't understand it, but the karma that we carry. Okay. So what you're talking about where your body armors itself. Yeah. If, okay. If it's bringing in a, in a trauma and it's accepting that trauma and develops some kind of a manifestation in the body, it's gone so far. If it's developed that actual behavioral manifestation as to have made an imprint on your soul. Most people don't understand this yeah. because the soul, the soul is the template for your next life as well as bringing the karma from your previous life. Yeah. And so you've just added, if you've accepted karma like that in a trauma without dealing with it and so on, you've just added to this, the, the problems you have to deal with in the next life. We're here in this life to learn what to do and what not to do. Okay. And that's really it. That's, it's, it's quite as simple as that. And so if you do those things that you, you shouldn't do, you get these responses from universe and you carry those forward. And next time it's kind of like slapping you up the face saying, don't do that again. You came into to life with a gimpy arm because of, you know, uh, stabbing all those people all the time in the previous life, you know, or something, something along those lines. Yeah. And it, it's not that simple, but, but nonetheless, the, the analogy of your soul being tainted by the, the karmic burdens you carry in this life, that's how they go. That's how the karma goes from life to life to life. It's like your soul is your, is your hash code. All the karma that you're developing has that hash code. When you re reappear in another life, then that hash code comes back into existence and all the karma gloms back on for you to learn to deal with. And so it's, it's relatively a simple system. However, uh, most people in modern science, as we've talked about, they don't go in and look at these other energies. They, you know, there are people like Dr. Dean Radin and uh, David Anderson who are looking at time and uh, examining things from a scientific perspective. They're examining woo-woo from a scientific perspective with scientific tools. And that is what really what makes them really cool. Now, the time aspect of this and the consciousness aspect of it, and then the soul uh, part of it being blended into this, uh, now we're getting into some really deep woo, okay? Yeah. And so when, when you go into the other part of the consciousness aspect of this, with psychedelics, you find that there are certain things that occur. Psychedelics can be used to interrupt that process. So I know a lot of guys that came out of NOM that were heroin addicts and got off of heroin um, by doing psychedelics. And, and it, they, so they didn't, so they're not going to carry that addiction burden into the, their next life because they dealt with it here, right? They didn't armor it into their body. It's not into their, tainted their soul. And so they can move on. A lot of people came out of Vietnam. They weren't into uh, the new age or the, the new culture, didn't get into the drug aspect. And so they drank themselves to death or had horrible experiences and spiraled down in spite of the fact that they may have actually had an easier time than many of the people that were, you know, smoking the China white and all of that just to stay, um, you know, marginally sane during the experience. Yeah. So it gets into really complicated stuff there. But uh, the, 
I think psychedelics are useful to the right personalities. Yes. And they and every personality has to know that if you take psychedelics, you don't go if you do it at the level that does you good, and we're not talking ecstasy here, we're talking, you know, the, the real deal, right? Yeah. Yeah. But if you do that stuff, you don't go back to work on Monday morning. It might take you two weeks to get your, your personality integrated you know, right. uh, reintegrated to the point where you're not drooling on yourself half the time or, you know, making inappropriate statements or, or still back in that experience or so on. Yeah. But they can be extremely enlightening. And they, they, I agree with you, there are some things that occur within the psychedelic experience where uh, it tests the, our understanding of consciousness. So I don't know if it's ever occurred to you, but I have actually had two psychedelic experiences, three that I can think of, where I've actually had contact with the other. Okay, now we can define the other with a big capital O because the other is consciousness that is not you. And, and it's clear that that consciousness is not you. Now, this yes. is different from being with a human where you can reach out and touch them and there's that physical materium separation within your mind at that time it's not like the the it's not like a hallucinogenics uh, uh, hallucinations it's not like a delusion it is an actual discussion and interaction a sharing of mind uh, and thoughts with some other consciousness and when you put that thought into the other consciousness it disappears behind a wall that is not you and so you know and when the stuff comes out of the other consciousness it's not coming from any other part of your own consciousness. So it is not some layer that's deep within you or some inability to deal with this sort of thing uh, where you're sort of tricking yourself. So I've had a lot of psychedelic experiences. The majority of them were um, self-oriented in, in dealing with my own issues. But there were those three times that I've specifically contacted the other in those experiences. And now the other presents itself in different guises in different times, okay, in different experiences. So once I was talking to the other as the other presented itself as a, as a mantis, as a mantid, okay, about six and a half foot high relative to myself. Uh, this was over on Crescent Lake. It was late in the summer, and we sat there and chatted for, I don't know, maybe an hour or more. And I learned a great deal of things from the Mantid. Uh, this was a very late in my experience of psychedelics, late in that process. Earlier on, I'd had a probably four hour mescaline experience where I sat and discussed with the other, again, on the side of a lake. Uh, but that lake was not <laughs> a lake in this reality. Mm -hmm. That was an interesting kind of a thing. Uh, and that, that was a being that at various, was more or less human, but it just at various times was slightly different colors. So, you know, it'd be sort of bluish for a while and then sort of purplish and then back to sort of greenish blue and so on. Not, not really mm, glaring or anything, but enough that you noticed it in the process of talking. It was as though he was expressing his emotions, not only in his, in his, uh, the emotionality of his thoughts, not only in, in the language, but also through the skin as a, you know, as like a, a, like a mood ring, but his skin. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Very sophisticated. Yeah. And so, and so, you know, that was an interesting, uh, out of this world experience, yeah. right? But it was still within the materium. I was just separated from my consciousness by the psychedelic drugs, separated from its usual uh, state of being. And I was able to connect with my consciousness. And, and in that episode also, I learned a great deal about the nature of the human body and how, and the nature of the human body was what later on, probably, let me think, that would have been maybe, say, 20 years later, I incorporated some of that knowledge into looking at language relative to prescience. Because the human body is interesting because we have all these layers, most of which we don't see. All we see is surfaces, right? So we only have four senses. They're in, in our craniums. This, the sensation of feeling that we get when we touch something is our body's a connection to what we call the feeling mind, all right? It is not a sense. There is no sense organ for feeling touch the way there is for sight, sound, uh, hearing, or taste. In each of those cases, you don't actually see the light. You're presented with the complete image from the subsystem of your eyes. Right, right, yeah. It's you, don't, you don't hear the sound, right? Yeah. So, so it's really interesting that you only have these four subsystems as senses. And 
the, the discussions on a lot of these things relative to consciousness and with this other being was about, that particular discussion was about the nature of the human body and its shells. And you can think of them as, at the time, it seemed really simple to me to visualize. He said, you know, you think of them as shells in your electrons. You know, that the, the, when you look at it and touch it out there, the electron is right there. But if you're not looking at that particular level out from the proton, the electron isn't there until you go to look at it. But if you were to look at the human body in a particular way, you would see that we have these shells around us. So we have our solid, solid body within which is our fluid solid body. Right. And we suck in air, but there's also an, an airy body to us yeah. because you, and you see this out in, um, uh, as there's temperature differences between your body and the other atmosphere, you see sort of an, an airy atmosphere that clings to you. And now we know that we never really move through the atmosphere. Now, what actually happens, science tells us, is that a layer of atoms of air glom onto us. And when we move ourselves through the atmosphere, the atmosphere is gliding over that other layer of atoms of atmosphere, not gliding over us. And even when we feel wind, the wind is actually other atoms of atmosphere that are displacing atoms of atmosphere that are already on us. So our, our interactions with our own environment are not like what we've been taught and what we really perceive. Yeah. Unless, of course, you go and you talk to these guys on the sides of the lake when you're taking lots of mess. I feel like I was, <laughs> I was listening to somebody the other day talk about having interaction with someone that they, an entity on an ayahuasca experience. I think this was, um, and if I'm getting this a little bit wrong, I apologize. I'm trying to get the gist of it right. I think I heard Frank Castle, who's on, he has a radio show on Truth Frequency Network, and he does a lot of ayahuasca journeying. And he said he was speaking with an entity that was explaining to him that when we travel, we're actually not going anywhere. Like when we, right. Yes. Right. Yeah. The similar yeah. kind of thing that you're describing. Yeah. Right. And, and see, this is why I also know that time travel isn't possible, at least not into the past, but that we can actually, I know all kinds of things about time that negate those two philosophical views. Okay. I can present you with a third, very practical philosophical view of time that allows time to be used very interesting ways in a, in a, in a, a pragmatic, practical, even industrial sense. So David Anderson, for instance, with his closed time-like loops, he's yeah. basically making a temporal lens and a temporal filter. If we he's making what he way. calls time domains, basically. Right, but let's, yeah, let's it. He used it in satellites to basically create its own time domain in which it could function because of the stressors under which they went. There was a need to regulate. That you can probably explain this better than I. Well, do. Uh, there's there's very really very little point because we can make very good analogies for everybody yeah. who who doesn't want to get into it. Yeah, and that's the idea of a time lens where we focus time on something. Right. And yeah. you would say, well, why would you want to do that? Well, if for instance you wanted to age cheese really rapidly for a hundred years or wine and get really good wine, you could do it in elapsed time of maybe days, but inside the time, underneath the time lens, maybe the wine ages 100 years, you know, or that kind of thing, or we wanted to put a patina on brass or something, right? I mean, you just, these are trivial uh, uh, uses of it, but that's what a time lens would be like. And then a time filter would be filtering out the effects of time on whatever is inside the, the container. So you could, for instance, have a time refrigerator that as long as you had the, this filter of time over it, the stuff would never spoil because it would never progress in time yes. enough. And yep. it maybe it wouldn't even have to be cold. <laughs> All right. And, but here's the thing. Think about this too in the woo-woo world. Cloning. Okay. Nah, I was going to ask you. Okay, good. Okay. Cloning has to involve, if it's going to be real, which I doubt it is, cloning has to involve a very effective time lens because no matter what, human bodies can only grow at a certain rate. And so say you were going to try and clone a, a mm -hmm. person. Well, the idea is, okay, you'd go and, all right, we want to clone the most hated monster we can find. And so we snip off some of Hillary's, uh, you know, earlobe, all right? <laughs> we're going to clone Hillary Clinton. And so, uh, all right, but so what? It's going to take us 25 years to grow a Hillary Clinton uh, that, you know, is even into her 20s, let alone 50 years to grow one who would be a match for the one we've got now. And so the original one would die. So there's no point in cloning a body of Hillary Clinton unless you can rapidly age it, right? But if you can rapidly age like that with a time lens, which I believe these time lenses are, are practical devices you can build, 
If you could do that, there's still all kinds of ramifications for consciousness in cloning that make cloning um, very difficult to conceive of as being a, a practical science ever. And some of the ramifications in consciousness had to do with the soul, the fact that the anything that's cloned would not have a soul, would not even necessarily develop the same form of, of brain structure just because uh, there's a whole lot in us that is the result not of our DNA, but as a result of experience and the crap we've been through, yeah. right? So when you clone someone, do you get a scar? Do you get that same scar on the thumb that, that he had? No, there wouldn't be any point to it. The only reason that that exists is because time and, and circumstances intervened with <coughs> the material reality. What about sort of a... Um because since you brought up clones, I'm going to ask you a little bit about, so you said you, you doubt that it exists. So a lot of, there's a lot of information out there about cloning. And I agree that maybe that that isn't the appropriate word to use. Do you think that there is something else going on that is more like a um, copy and paste kind of technology? Basically, copy that, and that, would, that would be a good word, copy, replicant. replicant. Copy and technology. paste and then. Yeah, I don't like the, the term clone. It's too loaded. It's emotionally charged. Okay, so I like the term replicant. Okay, so replicant or, or copy and paste or whatever. And then certain kinds of partial, um, I don't want to say consciousness transfer because I agree with you that consciousness is something very, uh, but sort of some sort of an attempt to replicate consciousness or an attempt to replicate um, uh, memories and then sort of like on some sort of type, type of technology or whatever, like uh, sync that up or implant that into this replicated human bodies, right? You're talking uh, like the um, <coughs> the like the Schwarzenegger movie. I have I <coughs> six, seen the Schwarzenegger. Six day or whatever. I haven't seen the Schwarzenegger movie, so I'm not sure. But like, but but I do understand what you're saying. Like, suck up your consciousness in in a machine and then shoot it into the clone. Like, kind of like what? So one of the things that sometimes like I've had, you know, in my vast <laughs> like, you know, I'm I spend a lot of time doing a lot of abstract thinking, and I have lots of strange thoughts occur to me. And sometimes it does almost feel like um, my like there's something is rec like recording my experiences from inside of me aside from just my own consciousness, right? Like there's some sort of technology attempting to uh, it, w watch what I'm experiencing in my own head, uh, some sort of observer kind of technology. Um, and there's let's, let's take the technology aspect out of that, and I agree okay. with you. Okay. Some sort of observer. Some sort of right. something is. And that's because that's because humans have seven minds. Okay. All right. And so what you're saying is that you're you've become aware of yet another mind that you have. A lot of oh. people call these your higher powers and stuff, right? Right. But but for instance, you don't do not think inside your brain. I know. Okay, so your yeah. brain is an antenna, and yes. so it picks up and connects to uh, uh, your body mind, your feeling mind, and your desire mind. These are usually the only minds that humans are aware of uh, when they're in this space in reality. You have other minds. You have a thinker mind uh, and you have a knower mind. Mm, uh, there's yeah. a, small, a smaller subset uh, of there that's, that's rightness and reason. Okay, these are also minor minds, so to speak. Okay. But here's, here's the thing. You could be in your regular, most humans truck around. Okay, well, getting back to your, your point about the cloning uh, real quick. Okay. Yes, I believe that there are people trying to do this, and I think that they're doing this, trying to do this um, uh, technologically, and I think that these are the same people that, that uh, are in that part of the population that believe we are our bodies, yes. that, think of, that think we're basically biological robots, okay? These are the people that are having their war on consciousness in science and in literature and everywhere else. These people believe that such things are possible, and they will not have that belief challenged because of their nature of their so Are you talking about people like Ray Kurzweil? Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and the, all of the people that funnel They're money into those ideas. They're basically a materialistic, um, a very materialist philosophy. Correct, and they will not have consciousness anymore. They, right. they've tried to get rid of it right. through destroying the Gnostics. They tried to get rid of it yeah. by destroying the Templars, all of these kind of things, right? Because they yeah. were really a Gnostic uh, sect within Christianity. Most people don't realize this, that the famous yes. um, uh, thing, there was this uh, uh, king that went to the Pope and, the, and he said, well, I can't go in and get rid of all of these Templars because there's a lot of good Catholics in among them, right? And the Pope said, kill them all. 
God knows his own. And it is from there that we get this saying, you know, um, <laughs> kill them all, kill them all God and sort God's, of, yeah, sort it sort out. out right. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, but these people believe they are the, their bodies and that is the yeah. fallacy from which all of that springs. Okay. Now on the other side of this, on the consciousness side of things, uh, the ability. Now, I don't believe that they're successful. I do believe you can do replication to some degree, and but you're not replicating the individual. You're not shoving consciousness consciousness over. There is no soul translation, right? And and there's impacts even on this on your next life and your next incarnation. And a lot of that is what these people are trying to right. not do, right? They don't want to reincarnate. They want to keep the power they have here, continue to exist, and all of this kind of thing, right? They don't understand what humans are. But do do they do they not care? Like I mean, obviously they don't care about much. Uh, Okay, so are any of these things they're attempting to do, like whether they're successful or, or not completely, are they affecting our actual consciousness, right? So like if they are trying to make a replicant of, of, of some of us and then trying to, whether it works or not, in some way copy our mind or our, what they think, that if they think they're copying our consciousness or copy our intelligence or our memories and put it into these replicated bodies does that have any kind of resonant effect on our consciousness our body it, it does but not at the consciousness level it has to do with the body mind level okay, okay. yeah so think of it this way think of it this way that you're the you have a mind that keeps you breathing whether you think about breathing or not okay right. it keeps your your kidneys functioning whether you think you've got to go pee or not right and so this this is your body mind you know you're in your body mind when you sustain an injury uh, or where you're facing a life-threatening illness. Right. Because you, at that point, actually, you can know all three minds the clearest is when you're in, in your greatest peril. And you can easily, if you're paying attention and self-monitoring, you can see yourself shifting from mind to mind to mind. So for instance, you're in great peril, you think you might die. And so all of your focus is on your body. And there's this very uh, tenuous feeling you have, so to speak, with your connection with reality. At that stage, you can find your mind shifting into feeling mind where it's all of the emotions and stuff and, and you want to express them and all of this to all the people you've never expressed them. You're mm -hmm. deep into that feeling of it all, right? Or you're into desire mind where, oh, I've got to live because I've got to do this. I must achieve that. I've got to make it right with these people or whatever. And so that's where the willpower to overcome things like uh, life-threatening uh, conditions yeah. comes from not from the body mind because the body mind when it's stabbed and I've been stabbed so I'll let you know the very first thing that happens is that that your consciousness collapses into your body mind and any thoughts beyond that are, are really not possible during okay. that period of time when you're struggling with shock and that that sort of state so in that sense the um, the nature of the mind that you're feeling uh, those are the three minds you usually exist in. Now, they could be doing this cloning stuff. Let me get back to your observer issue real quick. Okay. What you're feeling is one of your other two minds, likely. The knower okay. mind or the, the real thinker mind. And so this is actually a sign of um, personal um, uh, progression. Okay, because mm. the you know an enlightened being operates in many more than just the three minds of body mind, desire mind, and feeling mind. Okay, they'll actually get into thinker and knower. But anyway, so getting back to the resonance issue. Okay, so your body mind is it? It's not aware that you've been cloned or that there is a replicant that is being built, but those cells that are taken from you that are used in that process create a resonance in our physical reality simply because they are basically working off of the same codes that your body mind is trying to control so it may cause a certain level of disharmony within yeah. your personal body mind as these other um, things are attempting to be grown simply because they're also in the same universe vibrating yeah. basically at the same level of your complexity and thus yeah. your body mind is going to pick them up. So let, let's take another little uh, tangent here. Okay. And go back to the idea that there, that reality and, and from my viewpoint is based on a pulse and that there's this pulse that started off in no space, no space at all. And so the, the pulse came out, it happens 22 trillion times a second. 
And so the, the pulse came out, and since there was no space anywhere, it crossed itself in no space an infinite number of times within that very first second, of, or very first 122 uh, trillionth part of a second, until complexity arose. And then there was a pause, and then it pulsed again through the exact same spaces, non-spaces, to recreate that exact same complexity, and then it added more complexity on more it. Complex. Okay, right. so now here's the thing. So here's the idea. That pulse, when it, when it got complex enough, when the overlays got dense enough, matter was created because this pulse is energy and it did the E equals MC squared back the other way to create matter, okay? And when it did so, that matter created space with it. And, and along with space came the potential for time. I, but I don't it. think there's I such a this. thing as space time, okay? All right, no, so here's... I this is the little bloop yeah. theory. It's not the Big right. Bang theory, okay? Yeah. And so universe is continually doing that because that pulse continues, all right? So it's creating new matter way the hell out in the far reaches of the universe right now. And space being created with each chunk of matter. And so you can see the very first chunk of matter it created was the hydrogen ion, the very simplest form. But now it's out creating molecules that are incredibly dense and complicated and so on. And so get yeah. this, this relates to all of us because our body minds have, for lack of a better word, a numeric value that represents our specific level of complexity as we go through time. Okay, that level of complexity changes as we go through time, as it results from the scars and the other levels of complex stuff that occur to us that we take in. And if we take in enough of this stuff, we can actually impress it deep enough that that level of complexity goes into our soul and goes with us to the next life. Yeah. So it's, it's all integrated in that regard, right? But so here's the thing about the, the time and, the, and the, uh, the pulse of all of this. Our body minds have, so, a, so to speak, a complexity value. And so this is another reason I know that time travel into the past is not possible. And it's not possible because I am a complex being now that has molecules in me now at this age that, that uh, did not exist in the 1950s. So if my body was to attempt to be shoved back into the 1950s, the pulse of the 1950s would have to suddenly accommodate the complexity of the 2017s because I would have to be recreated. Otherwise, there would be like a giant antimatter explosion as my body went and annihilated itself because the pulse annihilated itself because it couldn't cope with the complexity. What about, okay, what about time travel into the future? Is that, uh -huh. some, okay, is that something that is either A, possible, or B, we're just calling, we're, we're calling it the wrong thing. It's actually something else because we tend to think of things as past and future. It's actually... Some, we're thinking Let's of qualify wrong. something. Are we talking physical time travel or are we allowing for the fact that I'm getting echo off this? I don't know why. Yeah, it came in when he was talking about the really interesting stuff. Okay, so. We, we, we had somebody who's joined us. Let me back off the mic, see if that helps. So are we talking physical or are we allowing for the fact of a remote viewing type of situation where consciousness yeah. itself projects Project. either forward or backward? Okay, remote viewing is not as people understand it, but I, I would say that we do have that, okay? Corporeal time travel I understand not, it's not by itself a, a time right, right. mechanism. Yeah. yeah, right. And consciousness is yes, and is independent of time. So if you could actually figure out a way to talk to consciousness, you could ask it about any time and get an accurate impression, right? If you could figure out how to do that. Corporeal time travel is not possible. So, so Bajiago was never shoved through an energy field Agreed. and pushed pushed into any other time. Nor could we do that with time travel into the future corporally. In essence, we are all traveling into the future every millisecond, right? right. We're all time travelers in that regard. Now, time knowledge and knowledge of potential and probable events into the future, that's my business, okay? Yeah. Huh. And I understand, I think, why that occurs. And it goes back to your understanding of the body and what we were talking about, the human body and how there's all these layers on it, okay? Because it's some layer way out there, which we can actually measure. If we get all the right gear, you can detect heartbeats sometimes 60, 80 feet away. Individual magnetic signatures of, of individual hearts that can be 
detected that far. We do it with heat. Heat sensors can find you from helicopters hundreds of feet, so, feet over you. And you can get a heat signature that while it varies because of exertion and so on, there's a core level of it that can actually be tagged by computer and you can identify one person from another in a crowd based on their heat signature from their heart, you know, how much clothing they happen to have on at that moment, but also the blood flow and everything. But there's a layer out there that we can call, for lack of a better word, a radiant or, or energetic layer, okay? That energetic layer, in my opinion, is really quite connected to the soul. Yeah. And is, that, is it that energetic layer very that unique, right? karma attaches to us? It, it's, very, it's, and it's very unique, right? It's a very... Correct. Like that. Yeah, okay. Correct. Absolutely unique. And this is why yeah. I know, again, cloning and uh, time travel don't exist as we're told, all right? Because within my, within my understanding of the universe, because we can't go back in the past because of the pulse couldn't handle the complexity jump. And uh, because now there's molecules that the pulse in 1950s didn't know how to make and that has to make them now. And, I, and some people will think that's a really lame argument, but if you really think about it, uh, there's also the other aspect of it. And that is that consciousness doesn't exist on all those people that have died. And so you couldn't go back and find their consciousness in the 50s, recreating the things that, that they had thought about, so to speak. Now, there's some sort of weird loopholes to this, but in any event, uh, the, the nature of, um, I'm sorry, I lost the thought there. Would you, so we were talking about future. Uh, <laughs> oh, future projection, right, right. Yeah. Okay, so you, you, we can't travel into the future corporeally, but we can know what the future is going to have for us. Now, mm -hmm. what we'll find, though, is not certitude, but it, it is probability or potential, okay? Even in an electrical sense, although we're not dealing with electricity, there's a potential for certain levels of the pulse in the future to coalesce into certain ways to create certain kinds of events. Now, so we can say certain events are more likely to occur, and we can say this at one level because of the personalities in there, because certain personalities have their own level of karma. So if you had a karma reader, right, and so you could hold up a sheet of, of paper and look at people through the sheet of paper and see their karmic effect, you can say, oh, if that person gets elected president, we're going to have a war because of these things within their karma, forcing them to always think that particular way. Or if that person is in this particular job, this accident will occur because of the nature of the karma that affects that person. And you can say that there's a potential for that to occur. And then whether it manifests, whether that probability bubble collapses into the future you project, that's where we get into the error ratio, especially within my work. Because what I'm trying to do is to aggravate a lot of these clues and see where the probability bubble of potential is going to collapse into a reality. And this is something that Cozy Rez, Rez talked about. This is what they talk about in the quantum computers. They are always talking in quantum annealing. They're basically throwing up all of the atoms and then collapsing it and hoping that the answer is within the collapsed field. Quantum computing is nowhere near as deadly as people think, by the way. Quantum computing is just, it's, it's into some serious woo-woo and they've got some big problems developing as a separate, <laughs> entirely separate thing. But so here's how the future actually works. We know, for instance, from the work of Dean Radin, whose work is re replicated in many different universities, and he even, he's replicated it over and over again, that humans can see in the future. You yeah. know who's on, you have a feeling, your, your feeling body knows who's on the other side of the door before you open it up frequently, or who's going to be on the phone even before you see the caller ID, right? Or even yeah. know, you, you know, you're, you hear in your head a millisecond before the ringtone actually starts, you hear that ringtone from that person and you know they're calling you. And you don't even think about it anymore. But, if, but in the old days, before caller ID and all of this kind of stuff, it was a common thing in telephone conversations to say, oh, I knew it was you. Yeah. You know, it just happened yeah. all the time. And then caller ID came along and it was like, no point to saying that sort of thing anymore. However, that shows that our consciousness is connected to the future events that will affect us at a body level. Okay, it's in this body that that's being affected and it's presenting itself and our consciousness can say, oh, look, it's so-and-so calling. This other consciousness that's coming through and my body is resonating in this way at this time. Does, does our consciousness exist sort of outside of time yet creates time in order for us to experience itself? I don't know that it creates time. Okay, I don't know that. Or that but it the other aspects, it, it attaches, attaches, correct. It attaches to okay, time. That's, so that's that how I have, think of it. 
some sensible way to experience it, some way that we can decode or understand. Interpret. Yeah, interpret. Inter integrate, correct. Okay. Yeah, That's yeah, yeah. my understanding. Integrate. The best integrate is good, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we have, we have karma. We got to work out. And it doesn't really work if we don't have time, if these events are not presented to us in such a way. And so here's the beauty of karma and our thinking. The, and, the, and I know that we're in a system that leads to progression. Uh, what that progression means to uh, individual consciousness, I can't go into. It'd be all speculation, but we do progress. But I know that this is the case just because we are able to affect and that always we don't have robotic, biological or otherwise, results. So in other words, human behavior is so variant that when the probability potential collapses into a reality, sometimes it collapses this way. And other times, for it may collapse another way, even though the potential is all the same right yeah. there. And it collapses differently based on the personalities involved. So mm -hmm. consciousness affects time. Cozy Rev noticed this when he it's was in the kind of similar to epigenetics. Like a similar Correct. Idea, genetics. Only the other way. Only the right, other yeah. way. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So time, time can affect biology. And, and we know that time affects biology because we wake up and we look older. Got white in my beard. That kind I don't of know thing. what you're yeah. talking about, Cliff. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, it doesn't show on you at all. And we'll get into that some other time. <laughs> but, but, but time affects biology. But biology, our consciousness through our biology, also affects time. Yeah. Cozy Rev noticed this when he was in the gulag. And I noticed this the very first time I talked to Randy. The very first time I spoke to him, within milliseconds, I noticed he was temporally sensitive. Okay, so that tells me in my scheme of things that Randy's got a contact with something other than those three minds. All right, so he's either into occasionally into his knower mind or occasionally into his thinker mind. And that that in, intrudes mm -hmm. and leaks into his experience in this reality and how he expresses it because he's picking up temporal things. Yeah. The body mind is not particularly time sensitive at all, right? Desire mind is never time sensitive. Feeling mind lives in time continuously and always wants it to exist longer to maximize that feeling or minimize that feeling depending on whether it's a good or a bad feeling, right? And now note, women are more often in... Uh, combination of body mind feeling mind and men are more often in body mind desire mind okay and so there's ways that the and there's reasons i think that mind control is being done the way it is and mm -hmm. there's also reasons that they attempted to harmonize with uh, certain temporal influences to create the culture war that led to what I think people call third wave feminism, okay? Mm -hmm. And I see third wave feminism as an adjunct to transhumanism. And yes. I see that as, a, as an aspect of things that they're trying to do to alter the balance between feeling mind and desire mind and to force us into uh, certain relationships that way for their own reasons. The, you know, the evil bad guys, the powers that be with all of their uh, G wave um, stuff and, and all this yeah. kind of business. So it's a very interesting uh, situation relative to uh, consciousness and the relationship of consciousness to time and the future. And in my work, I've had to codify words, which are one of our expressions in the materium of the vibration that is us experiencing the vibration that is universe. Mm -hmm. Now, the people that are, that are trapped in their bodies, that think they are their bodies, the robotic uh, biologists or biological robot guys, they see matter as solid. They don't think we're energetic. They don't see matter as being, they don't really buy the idea that, that uh, atoms are a wave or a particle, depending on whether you want to poke at them or, or ride them, right, basically. And so we get into these conflicts, and I think that's where mind control, I think that's where the memes of cloning, I think it's all these transhumanists and those kind of guys that are out monkeying around with this machinery to try and mess with consciousness. Not understanding that no machinery ever will be able to manifest and, and affect consciousness. It is, that would be the same idea that something you could build in SimCity uh, uh, simulation would show up in your garage. The only thing they can hope for is that people will become so invested in SimCity that they will begin to believe that that is reality, right? 
Correct. Okay. And thus we get into the the blue chickens and all of those yes. kind of things yeah, also yeah. being being pimped out and about. Burning Man, the yep. European version mm -hmm. of Burning yeah. Man, yeah. Yeah. you know, all of these kind of things, right? And so those are all attempts to do consciousness engineering, if you will, or manipulation, as I believe CERN is, and to a certain extent, I think all of the uh, quantum computers are as well. But because these people have a, a misunderstanding of the materium, in my opinion, because I'm against the mainstream science, they're working on the Big Bang Theory, and I'm on the Little Bloop Theory. Right? I like Little Bloop better so far. <laughs> so do I. It makes a lot more sense. If you want to read a real scientific understanding of the Little Bloop Theory, go read, um, I'll, I'll come up with the word, the name of it later, but it's Dr. Fred Bell. And yes. he wrote some, well, he's he's some marvelous brother. books. He's our, isn't he? is, is Fred Bell no. Art Bell's brother? No. A cousin. Cousin. Oh, his cousin? Okay. cousin. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they are related. Yeah. yeah, and he was killed by the CIA. Right, right uh, after, right when he was, right absolutely. after yeah, to, uh, Jesse Ventura. Right, wasn't it like a day after or something like that? Yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah. But anyway, he was a marvelous mind, and he had come to many of the same conclusions I had independently. And when I read it, I was quite shocked when I read this. I think it's the the secret of intelligence or how to get intelligence, some weird name for this book, but it's just phenomenal discussion about yeah. how reality forms itself. And I wanted to get hold of him to find out if he'd taken that thinking to include consciousness after that. And I, I didn't, I just don't know that he had or not. He was, he was deceased by that point. Yeah. Uh, one of the few people I would have traveled to actually talk to and say, okay, you son of a bitch. Now tell me what you think about this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he had a really good sharp mind there, but see, these guys don't grasp it. And so that's, what's gotten all of us into problems because they're taking us down this irrational materialism viewpoint and leaving behind everything that makes us human. And here we are in this set of circumstances that are not doing us very well. But at the moment, we're busting out of it. The, that aspect of our culture has changed. We're going through temporal influences that won't bring it back. Like we discussed in our first show, we're down through that loop. And yeah. We're coming out of that second hundred years. Those temporal influences are, are manifesting. So there's things that are bigger and, and larger than our individual consciousnesses at play. And our individual consciousness is, um, so to speak, swimming in this larger sea of consciousness ex expressing itself as the reality around us. And I think that we've had it, it's done with the lessons that we could have learned from being stuck these last 30 years in a, in a degrading bond cycle in a, in a corrupt society and all of these kind of things. So we're expressing all of that karma that needed to come out. And so we won't be repeating that. We're not gonna stay in this. We're gonna evolve into something else, probably extremely rapidly over these next four or five years. Do you see, I see this a lot. Do you see right now, maybe it isn't like the masses of people but it's, and I don't mean this when I say like specific individuals, I don't mean that they're more important than others, but there are specific individuals making changes in their life and beginning to live their life in a way that really affects that, 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 that has the effect that you're talking about, that is the bust out kind of thing that is going to allow, make it harder for them to, to control the masses because certain specific individuals, let's say that have a certain energy or aura or presence about them that it them doing it magnifies out even if not everybody else is doing what they're doing the fact that certain specific people are making certain changes in their life that will prevent prevent them from being controlled the way that we all have been controlled in the past and just them continuing on that path and other people even if they're just observing it makes that change your of happening. course of course and you're you're talking right you're specifically talking right to why yeah. That Pope, I forget what his name is, on uh, you know October uh, the 13th of Friday, had all of the, the Templars rounded up and, uh, and incarcerated and killed. They used to kill people for having uh, ideas right. and, and spreading those ideas because they knew how dangerous it was. Yeah. All right? And then as we'd we all, grew we'd, up- We'd in, all be in trouble, Cliff. <laughs> <laughs> if they still did that, we wouldn't be here. You know, that's the way it is. So, so we're, we're, but we were born specifically in this period of time to, to go through this yeah. time in order to have our, our karma and our consciousness learn from what this time offers us. Okay, yeah. so there, I know people that are actually, they, and I expressed it myself in my youth, a fascination with a particular period in the past. And a lot of people have this, right? And it leads to those um, people that get really hyper uh, fixated on it and say, oh, well, you know, I was, I'm a reincarnated handmaiden to, you know, uh, Nefertiti or someplace. Right. right. 
okay, well, they're fascinated with that period of time. They don't know why their consciousness at this stage, their, their body, mind, feeling, mind, uh, desire, mind puts a connection there. They accept it. And that's their reality. And that's their paradigm. And it does not matter that at some level it's probably true. And at some level it's hundred percent false because we have no way of knowing who we were in a past life, but frequently we will know those ages in which we lived in past lives because of an emotional resonance yeah. to the history, the people, the time, the colors, the colors, the architecture, you know, the art. So you're not a fan of past life regression, I take it. No, see, there's the thing. Okay. Uh, it's, I'm not a fan of it. I think it can be extremely useful, but I think that the paradigm that they use around it is misunderstood because they, uh, they think of it as regressing through into past lives. And in fact, what they're actually doing, I believe, again, in my, in my uh, perspective, is that they're moving the ability of that body to connect to its consciousness. Now, if you can do that, the, the past life might not even be your own because your consciousness might know something of someone else's life and be handing you basically what you want to know because the consciousness is indiscriminate about that in terms of it will provide you, as we know from taking psychedelics, with what you want to learn, yeah. you know, and what you need to deal with. So past life regression, I think, is extremely uh, fascinating, just as is the... Um, the backward speaking thing, you know, yeah, reverse, uh, yeah, but that reverse. does not, that yeah. doesn't relate to yeah. subconscious because we don't have a subconscious mind that way. We have consciousness. And then when we're not conscious, we're not conscious, <laughs> right? There is no, unconscious. So you're not, you're not saying that we, we function in a two tiered consciousness system where the subconscious mind is basically buried and we're operating from the top projecting la layer of, of consciousness. Don't buy it at all. That comes from uh, Sigismund Sh uh, Shlomo Freud, okay, who was, a, <laughs> who was a morphine, cocaine, and nicotine addict, so bad that he allowed it to destroy his body, uh, had his jaw removed, and still insisted on smoking cigars, and whose uh, ravings about his own uh, mental aberrations uh, went to 400,000 words were picked up by the council on, uh, or excuse me, by the Tavistock Institute right. and promoted for their own purposes and sold lock, stock and barrel to the Soviets to use for their uh, incarceration uh, stuff. So no, I, I don't, I don't buy the idea of the subconscious and the mechanisms that they're describing and alluding to in the subconscious, the id and the ego and all of this can be more easily explained with a different paradigm relative to our, uh, how our conscious mind works within body mind, feeling mind, and desire mind. Bearing in mind, your body connects you to all of the trauma and the armoring and that level of the karma and so on. The other thing I wanted to ask you, Cliff, was as few were aware of the work of Benjamin Liebet, uh, mind time, the, the temporal factor in consciousness. No, I haven't run across okay. it, except it's as an adjunct to um, Dennett uh, in his book on consciousness. Okay. Okay, what's interesting about Leibit is he basically says that we're functioning in a time sequence where there's, he says a half second, it could be milliseconds before the actual physical action occurs. Uh, use the example of a tennis ball and that tennis ball coming across the court. You're actually responding to the tennis ball before it's ever left the opponent's racket. And effectively, you're moving within that quick of a time frame ahead of the actual physical event itself. Right. And from the predictive mind, from the pattern matching mind. Pro okay. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Okay. And so what yeah. that is, is the senses providing you with a, um, a presumed trajectory. And that goes more to the illustration of how fast thought is relative to the slowness of the physical condensate in which we live, the material reality, right? So... The, and like with Dennett's work on consciousness, well, you get at some point to the same kind of a problem that, that Freud had. No matter what Freud did, he was using his mind, which he thought of as a single entity, to examine his mind. So basically, he was using his mind to look at his own behavior and drawing conclusions on it and then trying to press them out to everybody else. Interesting. Yeah, Carl Jung basically did the same thing, although not on the level of necropathy that, that Freud did it. You know, right. Jung was a little bit more healthy in his viewpoint, but 
he was kind he was kind of experimenting on himself and and that's okay but you notice all psychiatrists are basically wacko you yeah know, they're of all course. they're all they go that's why into they go it into because, it right and yeah. that's why i like cozy rev right yeah. cozy rev was a scientist an astrophysicist who was forced into uh the gulag and during that period of time he while well, his imprisonment he started thinking about time because he had no other uh tools or anything he had to only do it with thought when he came out of there he had a lot he, of time on his hands <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah do, doing time can do yeah, that too yeah. yes yes but he came out and he thought about time and he was able to prove that our consciousness can actually affect time so we know that it's not really a, a we can presuppose that the tennis ball coming over the net and the, us getting our hand and the and the stuff out there a millisecond ahead of, of it is uh it's not really time uh altering from our consciousness just the predictive mind you know basing all of that now i've been in situations of aikido okay aikido is an interesting martial art because there's an aspect of it that's all about key about the life energy mm -hmm. which is basically about contacting and connecting to consciousness and so aikido is very much about mind body harmony and so in there we have exercises key exercises these key exercises teach you things that at some people may say it's hyper observation all right so you can sit there as a as somebody who's done these exercises in an aikido uh environment and you can know if, and you're going to have your, your partner, the nage, the person who's going to be thrown, is going to attack you. And you know before they even move when they're going to move. And if you are as I am, you get to the point where you've trained your body to react to your mind much more rapidly than most individuals. So there's this saying, right? Uh, the novice um, moves from the edges of the extremities. And the senpai, the senior student, uh, they, they move from their joints. Okay, and the the um, uh, adept moves from the torso, and so that's a very fast movement, right? You just move your hips a fraction of a second, a fraction of an inch, and your entire body shifts, and the bullet or the knife passes you. And there's no real observable heaving or anything because you're not reacting from your from your uh, digits, from your extremities. But the master, the master moves from the mind. Okay, and that's the most fastest and the most subtle kind of energies around. And I faced it when I was um, learning Aikido, and I was always amazed at how these black belts would know when the thought in my head had formed to attack then. Now, this was before I'd be traded in the saccadic eye movements, before I'd be traded in the slight stiffening of the, of the uh, skin around the ear you'll find that your sensory apparatus will always betray movement a millisecond before the rest of the body does. We harden up our, our head, so to speak, before we actually start making any other movements. But the master in Aikido is able to sense that key energy. So even just as soon as the thought had formed in, in my head, the black belt would have already had his hand moving and would simply come on out with his finger and you know, a light tap on my, on my chin and my key is disrupted and my attack has all gone to hell. And it, and it had nothing to do with force or any of that. It all had to do with concepts of time and consciousness and how it relates. Okay, so now I have a question. Sure. So what you just described, I think it helped me to formulate a question maybe I was trying to ask before. Do you think that a lot of these programs that were about time travel, like, you know, like Andrew Bashago's kind of thing, were really about observing children or people who had the ability to affect time with their consciousness to affect time with their mind and then try to understand these people who who don't want to materialize everything or don't don't who can't do it themselves or don't really get it on a certain level that that was what was really going on and that the somehow whether it be through some other kind of manipulation the, the child thinks that they've been through some sort of program where they've been time traveling or or traveling through space very quickly or going to far distant places when really they were it, they were just being put through a series of tests and exercises where they would observe someone being able to manipulate time with their consciousness or their mind i, I wouldn't buy that at that level okay? okay because i think that the people that that might have done such a thing as to kidnap children out of school to, to do that sort of experimentation actually would try and shove them through big energetic fields. Okay. okay. I think they, yeah. these are the same kind of people that think that, that matter can move through time. They right. think of time as being a, the frames uh, in the movie. They think of matter as being solid and somehow separate from energy. They don't grasp the idea that, 
the complexity of the pulse in the 1950s didn't include all kinds of materials that we have now, including pollution and that kind of thing. And so they don't really understand the nature of reality and okay. materialism because our, by the way, our, our bodies are not solid. Every right. no. 22 trillion times a second, the pulse is recreating my body. And think about it, if it did not, okay, say that, that we were solid then we would be like giant worms leaving a trail of bodies through time, so to speak. So your body, you'd just be have a, you'd have yeah. a, a, a giant worm over your entire planet as everybody moved around and, and, you know, because each body would be there for that particular frame and would right. go on. So no, okay. I actually don't think okay. that. I actually think that these people think that they're solid, think that they're material, okay. and they would be quite happy to shove a seven-year-old kid back into time if they thought it would work. And they may right. have fried dozens of seven-year-old kids trying to do that. Sure. I, I don't see any, any evidence to support the idea that there was any kind of a, um, uh, uh, an examination of minds uh, under those sorts of circumstances. We know that the powers that be used psychedelics on people. They mm -hmm. used, uh, had all kinds of drug experiments on soldiers and this kind of thing. And they did this through the 40s and the 50s. And they discovered that was a dead end for them. Later right. on, it was resurrected in the 60s yes. when they pumped out psychedelics into the general population to try and defuse the anti-war movement. And to, to disrupt sure. the, the I, I think it's still happening in, in a variety of new, different, new, and different sure. ways. But yeah, sure, I'm certain that they're doing it, and especially yeah. electromagnetically. And I think, yes. that, and I know for for a fact that they're in academia. They're still operating on the idea that we're solid material critters, yes. and that we can do things like that. I ran into a guy the other day who's who's a scientist who's been uh, really trying to beat me up on Twitter because my statement that terahertz waves can affect DNA. All right. And he's saying, oh, no, they can't. That's de debunked and all of this. And I'm right. saying, bogus, dude. Of course it can. Yeah. Yeah. And you're a condensate of, of energy. So energy that can read your DNA can affect your DNA. Yeah. So, you and know, it, and, get and, real. And it is. And it, and it not, is. And, and it is. Yeah. Right. That, so, okay. So in some ways, I, what you're saying, like there's these idiots are, who think this way, who would rather spend their time trying to shove children through space and time, whatever. And so it really is us out here um, uh, understanding and playing with the, uh, you know, playing with our own ability to affect uh, uh, time with consciousness. And so in some ways, I like that idea that they're not doing it because they don't even think it's a thing. So we're kind right. of left alone to do it on our own, which is better than having them meddle with it. <laughs> well, and also though, so, see, we do know that there are some practical uses for this knowledge. Yeah. So, so as a, as a, I know now how it is, how it is feasible to travel great distances stay in harmony with the pulse, which I, I put it in Latin, but we'll just use the English term of the ever present now. Yeah. So in the little bloop theory, when each atom is blooped into the universe and the universe continues to grow, which they never explain in the Big Bang how that, why that's going on. But in little bloop theory, it's obvious. If you're creating more matter all the time, everything has yeah. to grow, right? But when that happens, a uh, space comes in with each, each uh, atom brings in its own space. And space is not affected by the atom itself. It's created to accommodate that atom. When okay. it comes into existence, time, uh, okay, so it merges with all the other space that exists. But individually around that atom, it's independent. It's pristine. It's not affected by that atom. It's not affected by any other space. And it is technically independent of all other space. But it, it's so space is universally aggregated and is locally inviolate. Because space is unaffected by Doesn't anything. the atom itself actually generate a time domain? I mean, it would. It, okay, now there's, there's the rub, okay? okay. All right. We, we oh, can't Randy say, always has to come up with the right. rub. <laughs> right. Okay, so there's the rock in the pond. We can't say for sure whether uh, that is the case, but we can take advantage of that understanding, all right? Uh, we, there's no way at this stage because we can't measure real time. We can't quantify it. There's no way we can actually say it is being created by the atom as it comes into existence. There's well, I said that largely from a material standpoint because our basic fundamental measurement of time is the decay of an, uh, of an atomic material. Right. It really is fundamentally the only finite, minute, calculable estimation of time that we have in the physical universe that we but it's not inviolate it it's changes. not inviolate no <laughs> that's shocked the hell out of everybody it was the atomic clocks changed as the sun yes. has changed over these last five years right it actually changed during the tsunami in 2003 yes, yes. 
So isn't that so, interesting? Okay, so if that is the case, so so let's continue with that thought. Okay, so if you're correct, and we just assume whether it's true or not that that atoms are creating their own time domain, and that the domain, therefore, we can make some assumptions. Time must exist within those the the existence of those atoms, and should those atoms yeah. not exist, that time would not exist. Yeah. This gives us a particular kind of an understanding around atoms and the idea of two different types of gravity. Okay, a gravity A that works at the atomic level, and a gravity B that has escaped the atomic level and is what keeps us glued to all the other atoms, right? Keeps us from, from uh, falling off the planet. But it's not, gravity B is the stuff that sort of leaks out of all of the atoms combined into the generalized space. We know it's not very strong because I can jump up and defeat gravity just simply by jumping. And, and, you know, some beings that are heavier than I can't jump as high, so it's mass dependent, and there's all these things we can determine from it. But here's something else we can determine from it. Because we know that time is not, it is able to be changed, it is malleable, we, and we can change it by consciousness. All right, so here's some of the stuff in Wu I actually agree with. I think when we destroyed those spaceships in 1947, we discovered that they were using consciousness as part of their propulsion systems. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think that they did that because they were traveling outside of time. Now, bear in mind that the pulse itself moves outside of time. It recreates the entire universe of all matter in all of its complexity uh, for all size, 22 trillion times a second. And that, that universe dies 22 trillion times a second. It is recreated another 22 trillion times a second. So it, in order for that pulse to move through all of an expanding universe and take no more time each time it does it, it must move outside of time, uh. right? So universe is not slowing down. If anything, it's actually increasing its speed, not only of occurrence, but this makes sense because complexity begets complexity. So it has to do it, it faster. So it's going faster each time it has a new complexity on it. Correct. Got it. it has to work harder. So, so what, does that right. do, what does that do to entropy then? Are we, which works on a material level, but are we applying Entropy is malleable as well. Entropy is malleable as well. Cozy yeah. Reb proved that, okay? Cozy Reb proved that consciousness can uh, defeat entropy. And okay. I can, I can, I've done these experiments myself. I've replicated them and I've proved it to myself. Get two nails, get them equally wet, wrap them up in paper towels, put one nail in, in one shoebox, put another nail in another shoebox, take one shoebox, put it somewhere where you don't think about it ever, don't even look at it. The one shoebox with one nail in it, you look at that nail every single day. These are, are steel nails or iron nails, nothing special about them. And compare them six weeks on, you'll find that the one that you left alone uh, in the shoebox with the same level of moisture and everything is deteriorated far faster than the one you looked at every day. And if you were to go so far as to say, oh, nice nail, nice nail, it would even preserve it a little bit more. And so your consciousness is affecting the entropy that is part of the time of those two nails experience. So, so entropy is not inviolate. Ent entropy is not as we understand it. So I know we can travel outside of time. This is why I know Anderson is a dangerous fellow. So it's fellow. not about time traveling. It's about traveling outside of time. Correct. It's about the ability to jump to Proxim Proxima Centauri, right? Okay. And to just eliminate all the distance between us be because we know that distance is an illusion that's basically created by our consciousness in the material. Yeah. And yeah. we can jump that distance outside of time by the use of the time dilation effect that mm -hmm. Cozy Rev alludes to that is escaping outside of the atoms. And his idea is that if we can get hold of gravity A that's leaking outside of a particular atom, that we might be able to magnify that gravity A and create a time dilation and aim it at a particular spot and sort of like, I hate to use the word, but like magnetically jump to that spot based on dilating the time from this gravity A wave. And there's no real difference between gravity A and gravity B. It's just that gravity A rarely leaks outside of the atoms except in tiny little amounts. And then it's all aggregated into the big planet and we just don't really notice it. And so we think of gravity as a weak force, but gravity is really a tremendously strong force. It just doesn't go out very far. Okay, so if somebody, let's say me, experienced the episode of time dilation, right? right. And, and actually was in, had like sort of marked certain things with other people that was actually able to prove that somehow I experienced what seemed like four hours worth of time in the state when everyone else experienced two. I got you, okay? 
Like, what is it about me that allows for that to happen while the other people did not experience that? That is the, the intrusion into your three mind ordinary space of okay. your other two minds that we've talked about already, ah. the knower and the thinker. Okay. okay. Because the knower as part of your human um, humanness, so to speak, the knower is able to shift the granularity. So you can actually experience time at a level, and we all do this, a Randy probably more so than most of us, right? Because he's temporally sensitive. But everybody <laughs> bitches and moans about, oh, you know, homeroom just drags, right? right. Nothing going on. You just got to sit there. Or, you know, sometimes it fleets. Oh, man, that all happened so fast. We had so much fun. And, you know, and it just seemed to just fly right by. Or uh, you're doing time in prison, you know? Right. And so the time in prison just drags and drags and drags and drags. And isn't that curious, by the way, that in order for one group of humans to punish a human on this planet short of death, we deprive them of uh, time. time. Well, but really it's depriving them of the freedom to do what they want exactly. in that time. Yeah. Right. right? Which makes and the time we seem like... constrain them by time. Okay. So then the next question is, if you have someone who is temporally sensitive, I would agree that Randy is extremely temporally sensitive. I think I'm temporally sensitive as well, but not as much as him. But I do think that something about our interaction causes each of us to, in some ways, be even further <laughs> temporally sensitive sometimes. Hey, you're like, correct. Look at the movie um, uh, with uh, Nicholas yeah. Gage, uh, uh, where he was the card shark guy and, and the woman enhanced yeah. it. They've been telling us this in the predictive programming. Yeah. Yeah. So I would agree with you 100%. Okay, so, let's, so if I experience uh, time dilation or what I call sort of loose loose episodes with time or things like that a couple of times other people have been who are not normally like that have sort of been dragged off into it with me and and later cannot deny that something odd happened can one person sort of being temporarily sensitive affect those uh, around them sometimes in a way like, like, like that Certainly. And we okay. see this all the time. This is the basis for influencer advertising. It's okay. the whole nature of what is going on in YouTube. So if you actually look at things, you'll find that there's very few people that are doing um, original work. Okay. So let's look at you doing original work and your original work includes this time dilation. You have a level of presence that is um, enhanced by the knower or the thinker mind participating more in your experience in this reality than most other people would, okay? Okay. Because that occurs, you actually have a more powerful emanation at a physical and psychic level out through your various bodies. And so maybe you'd be one of those people whose, whose heart rate could be sensed 60 or 80 feet away, whereas most people, it's only 10 feet away. So those people that are, now bear in mind, bear in mind, our brains are nothing more than millions upon millions upon millions of little tiny crystals that are suspended in oil. Okay, it's an emulsified, em it's a, an emulsion of, of liquid crystals. And so we're an antenna. We're an antenna for time domain as well. Yeah. Not just simply thoughts, right? Yeah. Not just simply other impressions and so on. So you're actually projecting out your time dilation experience yeah. into those other people's perception of your shared reality wow okay and when you said that thing about the heartbeat i was going to say that maybe that's why my father has always called me hurricane emily since i was a kid because you can sense me coming from miles away <laughs> <laughs> right 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 <laughs> yeah and you'll you'll find that i'm like that too right and they call it in the in the aikido tradition it's big key You've got big key forward, yeah. right? And I would get into um, Aikido exercises and do key. Uh, I used to be part of this outfit called Shin Shin Soitsu Aikido, which really stresses the key exercises. And we'd do a half an hour, 40 minutes of key exercises before doing any martial arts. And at the end of that period of time, especially under things like fluorescent lights, mm -hmm. I can see everybody's auras. Yeah. I can see multiple levels yeah. of color. I've got the key flowing through me. Really, There's like really the purple largely. and the green. I know what you're exactly, talking about. Exactly, exactly. Especially, I, I was a gymnast and in gyms, they have the terrible fluorescent lighting, which makes you able yep. to see all of that stuff. And you could see when somebody had been really, not only just been generating um, a, a lot of energy based on the amount of effort they were putting into something, but also just based on 
uh, their level of consciousness about how scary the thing right. they were doing was, how difficult it was, uh, all of that kind of thing. And you could see, I know exactly what you're talking about. There was almost like light frames around the body that like, absolutely. Yeah. And I would see things like, um, I just because of that, I knew that this particular guy that I was, uh, uh, who was my partner in throwing, I knew that he had a, had a previous elbow injury. Because yeah. you could see the yeah. you could see the pinched in nature of the aura around the and yeah. you'd mention things like this and in, in the Aikido practice it just becomes routine that people say things like this and all this stuff all this knowledge is revealed and it has to do with consciousness being aware of these energetic emanations in the various different shells that actually yeah. make up the human body yeah it's quite fascinating see I mean this whole idea of thinking about time look at all the different things that it leads you into. Yeah. And you can use time and the thinking about it to make some really accurate decisions about things. So for instance, it's easy for me to say, oh, okay, Corey Good is full of bullshit, right? <laughs> because there's a couple of things. If they regressed him, he could never ever physically regressed him. Then are we to presume that his mind went back to the state it was when he was 16? If so, he could never ever recover any memories because they're no longer connected right. to his brain. They're no longer, those thoughts are no longer even there. If they, if we presume that he was physically regressed, what happens to all the scars and all of that kind of stuff that you had and all of these kind of things relative to time? Uh, and just thinking about some of the other aspects of it, you can use it to say, okay, well, yeah, I think Andrew, Andrew Bajiago, I think he believes it, yeah. but I think he's deluded, right? I don't yeah. think that he actually went back in time because I don't believe that there's any ability of energy to move other energy through a non-container. But you can also say, about things like this that, well, the thinking about this, because we now know that when we can actually affect time with our consciousness, that opens up a whole lot of areas that maybe the deep state guys in the dark holes are really exploring. Yeah. And maybe the ramifications of those lead to some things like quantum computers. So that was sort of what I was asking you when I was asking about uh, observing children who could uh, affect consciousness with their mind, right? Like maybe, right. So, right? Like, so there are people in the deep state that know, that are aware, that are aware of this and that are playing with it. Is that, that's, I, I, I think yeah. there's actually evidence for that yes. aspect of it. Okay. I don't think those people are trying to shove people through time. In, so you think in they're, separate pro fields. they're separate projects. Correct. Projects. Right. But there are things in the Federal Register, which is just basically a long list of contracts the federal government lets, that, that lead me to believe that the work that Anderson was doing in time is being replicated with variations in the yes. deep state because yes. they also want to know about this. Yeah. I also think that there's validation for some aspects of the Philadelphia experiment. Okay. Yeah. Now, yeah. now what, does, what does an effect... What does a time dilation induced by a large energetic pulse do to a human that goes through that? It may make them think that they've actually been thrown into the future for, for all oh. intents and purposes because it connects them with their consciousness, which ah. delivers information to them about their future or their so, past. It just so happens that it was their future in this case. Okay, so if a person had been part of a project or even just grown up in an area where some of these experimentations and projects were going on, where they were experimenting with these kinds of pulses, then they may have some of that kind of experience as part of their memory that they are, right? They may have the feel sense that they've been to the it's future. It's a field effect, basically. Field effect. Correct. Or but so, here's or, the problem, of course, that their mind is going to interpret that and, and tack on all kinds of crap that's just yes. crap. Right. Okay. Uh, Just because absolutely. it makes it easier to integrate and easier to believe and so on. Okay. But that's probably what's at the root of all of the Mandela effect at the moment. Yeah. Is the quantum computers pushing out all of the woo-woo from universe in order to create a sterile environment where these things might work. And in doing so, it pushes out all of the, the yeah. consciousness stuff, all yeah. the woo-woo stuff, and piles it up around those buildings, so to speak. So if you live in that proximity, you're getting a double dose. So in a sense, it's like a woo-woo lens that may include some time lensing in it as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> well, you see why I was all excited. It's like, oh, oh this is cool stuff. And you know, cool. we haven't even gotten into page two or three of my notes. No, I, I feel like <laughs> we could do a series of, I feel like we are going to have to, and we will have to slide that this will be a series that will stretch out over time. <laughs> hey, can, Cliff, can you, give us, can you give us a link for the article that you referenced tonight? And we can put that out. If you can put that into the, uh, the chat yeah, box. It's, it's andersoninstitute.com. Okay. 
And I'll, uh, I, but I'll give you the link. I'll send the link. By yeah, there's a, this. there's actually, if you notice there, there's a, a chat box. Oh well, yeah, sure. Attached yeah. to this, and you can just yeah. type. Just give us a link for that. Other yeah. question is, where do we find something close to a reputable translation of Cozy Rev that there's, I've gone, th gone yeah. through some of it. I, I don't know if it's a good translation or a bad translation or how to. Right. And here's, and here's the problem. I've got three of them. Okay. I've got three different translations of Cozy Rev's experiments by three different translators. Two of the guys I know are, are um, pragmatic, practical Russian translators and don't understand the nature of the words that they're actually translating. Mm. The third guy did, and it was a big difference. It made a big difference in the understanding, but he dropped so much of the stuff in the way of his translation that I don't really like it much. But I, there's this thing in Russian about these verbs of motion, yeah. okay? And, it, and it, it's like discussing consciousness in English. You get into some really interesting words around the words themselves. So yeah. cozy, my, res, my understanding of Cozy Rev comes from reading maybe 25 uh, of his actual um, um, monographs that he produced about uh, astrophysics, uh, as well as his books on his time experiments from translators. And then I've laboriously done one level of translation to realize that this third guy did a decent job, but he only went through about a third of the stuff I was interested in. So I, he was of no use to me, really. So you're not going to find a definitive good an, uh, translation of Cozy Rev and you won't find one into the woo-woo world because the people that are translating him now are the um, uh, and working with this material are on the quantum computer side. They're on the uh, you know the. So we need to find um, us a good a good Russian speaking psychonaut kind of person to help. Correct. I, I'm, I correct. might I might know someone who knows someone, so I'll see what I can do. Yeah, actually, there you go. Uh, there you go. Kara St. Louis may be <laughs> able to point us in that Kara St. Louis, and then I have a, yeah. I also have a very good friend who's Russian who is into all sorts of yeah. psychonauting kind of stuff that uh, may be able to help us. In now, now bear in mind, Cozy Rev was, was trying to regain his uh, standing as a practical scientist. Mm -hmm. So most of his uh, writings are not at the level that you and I are discussing here. Mostly it's descriptions of all these experiments he did and the results from the individual experiments. The most uh, meaningful thing you can find, if you could ever get hold of it, would be an in Russian language copy of his lab notes. Because he would make, we would, he had a lot, of, a lot of these experiments were outdoors. And while he was out there writing his lab notes, he frequently would write whole paragraphs of, of observations of his personal thinking about what was going on. And he would pose questions to himself. Is this occurring or is it that? Mm. So you would see his, see his thinking about what yeah. was going on in the experiment. Because many times he was as confused as, as I, all the rest of us are about time. And he was trying to definitively tie time down. Bear in mind, he was an astrophysicist. And what do they do? They project star movements and they're intimately involved with time and calculations and so on. So he tried to reduce everything down to uh, numerical uh, differential equations and wherever possible. So he was really involved in the calculus of time and, and to a lesser extent spoke about the... Um, uh, philosophical aspects of it. Yeah. And the two are almost sometimes at odds with each other. So that's a fascinating, exactly. fascinating exactly. man. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I guess we need to reconvene on this because I really would like to drill down into it a little bit more, Cliff. Sure. And we can get in, like I say, we can get into page two and three of my notes here. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And I, I don't think I have anything here that's really left. Um, but I'm glad you brought up time dilation because that actually was at the tail end of page three and it leads into this whole part of page four on uh the biological effects of time, Let, time i would like to know about <laughs> I, yeah. yeah so well, i see, think there are things you can do about that too i mean it's really interesting when you look at the anti-aging uh movement uh that's developing and stuff the the way in which many of the people are taking it from the the people that believe they are their body mind they're going to fail. They're failing. And all they have to do is to alter the your, micro, your microphone's dropping out again. Yeah. Oh, okay. Anyway, I was saying that all they have to do is alter the paradigm, and yeah. then they get into a different view of things. So, yeah. for instance, you were talking about, Emily, you were talking about the feeling of the solar energies and how people yeah. are getting a little... Well, look, it turns out that 
uh, there are very specific temporally required minerals in your body. And you can affect your, you can actually take minerals that will cause you to have a different physical sensation of the temporal impulse, if you will, around you. And this time feeling is in, in a way it's analogous to the uh, hurricanes trying to ground out. Without the minerals in your body, you can't feel those particular mm. kinds of vibrations. Yeah. And so, and so now I go and I look back at some of the things the yogis did, right? And the yogis were really hot on making this long journey up into the Himalayan mountains and taking this stuff called shialgi, s h s h i l a g i t. Okay, it's a smushed down ecosystem from at least 12,000 years ago, but maybe millions of years ago. It's a pristine ecosystem reduced down to fulvic and, and humeric uh, minerals. And so it sounds like 80... what Sophia was telling me about. So I was talking to Sophia Smallstorm about something similar to this the other day. Okay, go on. Okay, and anyway, yeah. so this stuff, which is, you know, I, I get this stuff here that's sourced from above 16,000 feet. I don't what know if it? you can see that in there. Yeah, that's good right there. Himalayan can... healing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and you notice yeah. where it's from, you know, it, it, yeah. you've got to get it from the right spot. It's a really interesting material. And I take it in lieu of any other form of minerals. And I've noticed uh, temporal effects because I do cozy ribs experiments, right? And so I, that was just an oddity. It was, oh, hey, it's a good for my body. I took it for health reasons and so on. And now I realize that there are actually complex minerals mm -hmm. that are required for appropriately uh, temporally sensing or interacting with time as a human being. This, yeah, there, there's a million places. Just with you bringing this up, there's a million places we could go with this. Oh so. my gosh! Know, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll have to do it again, guys. We will. Right. We will. Sorry, we'll we'll have, have, uh, we'll no, have our great. people call your people, and we'll oh, get that go. done. <laughs> I well, my people to... are my people are dogs, and all they do is bark. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, I think we can do this again and again and again. And yeah. I think it will be endlessly fascinating every time. So, um, no, this is really incredible. So thank you. And Quite we're good. happy to talk about time or anything else with you anytime you like, Cliff. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. and, it, and it was great of Randy to bring up the issue about Equifax because it's so, yeah. so significant to what's going on and stuff, you know. And it Absolutely. is timely. Yeah, it's very <laughs> timely. <laughs> and with that, we're out of time. And yeah. we'll see you the next time. This is Off Planet Radio. OffPlanetRadio.com is the website. And uh, we'll be back the next time. The truth is out there. It's inside you. Thank you.